Here's a look at what's coming up on C-SPAN. Just ahead, a House hearing on recent fish kill incidents on the East Coast due to the toxic microbe Fisteria. After that, Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt on global climate change. At 8 a.m., Washington Journal, with Chuck McCutcheon of CQ Monitor and Mark Anderson of Dow Jones Newswire. And live at 11 a.m., the Democratic National Committee's fall meeting with speeches by House Minority Leader Richard Gephardt and Vice President Al Gore. Next, fish kill incidents due to the microbe Fisteria. On Thursday, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee held a hearing on the government response to the recent fish kills and possible human health problems in Chesapeake Bay tributaries. Maryland Governor Paris Glendening and Joanne Burkholder of North Carolina University are among those that testify in this four-and-a-half-hour hearing. I'd like to thank our witnesses and guests who are here today and will begin this hearing. The emergence of Fisteria piscicida in coastal waters from here to the Gulf Coast poses an insidious challenge to the early warning systems meant to protect human, ecological, and economic resources from toxic harm. The one-celled bugs at the bottom of the food chain are biting back and we are struggling to find a way to restore the natural balance in which Fisteria and its kin can once again live out their complex life cycles in benign obscurity. Since suspected outbreaks or blooms of this ages-old algae began in 1987, they have elicited a wide range of responses from affected governments, industries, and individuals. Those varied responses from enhanced water quality monitoring to estuary closures reflect what is known, what is suspected, and what is feared about Fisteria. As an oversight subcommittee responsible for public health programs, our mission demands vigilance, that we constantly test the sensitivity and effectiveness of our defenses against infectious, infectious agents and toxic invaders. Until recently, the response to Fisteria has been episodic and disjointed separated by time, distance, and a reluctance to connect a few fish kills into a regional or national environmental crisis. After each toxic attack, the microbe receded to the river bottom, pushed out of public view by falling temperatures and rising skepticism about the real hazard of so intermittent an adversary. But now, with increasing evidence of serious illnesses coincident to Fisteria exposures in natural settings, Prudent public health practice calls for a more unified response. While each state may face unique problems when Fisteria strikes, this increasingly ubiquitous algae won't be blocked by political boundaries, and it won't delay its toxic attacks while we grope for scientific certainty as to its nature. So today we seek the most current, candid assessment of the risks Fisteria possesses to public health We're going to have a few interruptions today, sadly, but that's uh, the way it is. So today we seek the most current candid assessment of the risks Fisteria possesses to public health, and we ask how state and federal efforts can be focused in an effective, sustained program to determine the causes and effects of Fisteria contamination. When the pathogens causing CJD and mad cow disease emerged as possible threats to food and blood safety, we asked regulators and researchers to help us measure the appropriate response to unproven but potentially con calamitous public health risks. In our examination of Gulf War veterans' illnesses, we probed the very probable but still unproven causal link between toxic exposures and undiagnosed syn syndromes. Fisteria presents public health officials with both challenges, uncertain but potential grave risks, 
and the still mysterious relationship between environmental causes and human neurotoxic effects. This uncertainty calls for caution, caution to prevent panic, caution to avoid leaping to conclusions. But in crafting a response to a public health threat on this scale, better to err on the side of caution than succumb to complacency or wishful thinking. The task calls upon government, science, medicine, agriculture, and others to cooperate and collaborate in an unprecedented ways to unlock the mysteri mysteries of hysteria. We are fortunate to have as witnesses today the leaders in that effort, public officials, regulators, researchers, and an author who are answering the challenges posed by Fisteria. Welcome, uh, Governor Glenn Denny, and welcome to all the witnesses giving us their time and expertise in this hearing and the hearing this afternoon. Now, I think what we're going to do, we, we do have a vote, but I'd like to move forward and allow our uh, those of us up here to finish our statements. And, Governor, we're going to come back for your, your opening statement and then Mr. question. Chairman, I don't think we have enough time to do that. So, uh, do you want to just make your statement, yeah, Mr. Well, Townsend? Well, I'll break we'll now and then come right back as soon well, as possible. Well, I know, I know that uh, we have some who want to welcome. I would, um, Eva, you would like to say something before you come She has an opening statement, too. Yeah. What would you like to do? I'd like to just... I'd like to just break and go vote as fast as we can and just run back and then continue. We are at recess. <laughs> Let me begin by apologizing. Of course, uh, we've had a couple of votes, but we should be able to move forward now without any interruptions, hopefully. I want to thank uh, the chairman for holding this hearing today to examine the state and federal response to recent outbreaks of hysteria. In addition to the health effects which may be linked to the exposure to affected waterways, there may also be a concern about the toxin in the fisteria entering the food supply. Although there is no proven link, it, it should be noted that fisteria tends to attack menhaden, and menhaden is used to make food for dogs, poultry, swine, and farm fish. Additionally, its oil is used to make cooking oil and margarine for sale outside of the United States. Because little is known about the toxin, which triggers the documented adverse effects, it is unknown whether processing neutralizes its effects. I do not want to be an alarmist. I've never been and don't plan to start now. But I believe that any uncertainty about the safety of our food supply is unacceptable in 1997. The public has a right to understand that the government is concerned about the potential effects of health and well-being of all of Americans, not to mention the well-being of the animal community. That is important also. However, once this hearing is over and we've asked all the questions and debated the issues, we must be committed to providing federal advice and funding to continue research which will bring about answers to the mystery of hysteria. Congress may take some credit for timely response by recently providing $7 million to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to start developing an emergency public health response. 
But we cannot stop there and should not stop there. It is not enough to clean up the problem after it surfaces. We must take preventative steps to assure water quality for all of our constituents. We may need to take legislative action to amend the Clean Water Act and regulate pollutants which may contribute to this problem. Finally, let me say, Mr. Chairman, we should be aware that this crisis may provide a unique opportunity for federal state cooperation in coordinating research, reporting, and overall environmental efforts. I hope that each of us realize the magnitude of good which could be accomplished through such cooperative efforts. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding today's hearing. I look forward to working with you. I also look forward to hearing from the witnesses. I'm delighted that we've been joined this morning by the governor of the state of Maryland, Governor Glendening, and of course, an outstanding member of the United States Congress who's been here now for many years, one of our senior members, the Honorable Sidney Hoyer. So at this time, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And uh, Governor, we do owe you an apology. Your time is very important. We have um, uh, some votes that are, frankly, protest votes. And without passing judgment on the legitimacy of the protest, it's hard to know when they're coming up. Um, so we do apologize. This is not typical. Uh, but you do draw a crowd, Governor. I want to say that. Um, I'd like to call on an individual who's not a member of this committee, but uh, would you like, Mr. McIntyre, would you like to uh, make an op a statement and welcome your statement? Thank you very much. As a representative of Southeastern North Carolina's 7th District, I'm especially appreciative of the opportunity to speak to this issue today. As many of you know, and I know we have some good friends here from North Carolina with Dr. Burke Holder, Dr. Bruton, and longtime friend Wayne McDevitt. Welcome to, to Washington. We know that in southeastern North Carolina, our coastal areas, not only along our beaches, but also we are blessed with many natural lakes, rivers, and streams, and tributaries that fishing is quite a long tradition, commercially as well as recreationally in our area. Due in large part to the Clean Water Act that was enacted by Congress in 1970, the river and coastal estuaries in our area are now cleaner than they were 30 years ago. Industry and agriculture have made tremendous strides in cleaning up the waste and runoff. Yet today, this threat that we are having this hearing on is one that could cause great problems, not only for our natural resources, but also for human beings. Fish kills up and down the mid-Atlantic coast have brought national attention to this problem. Last week, we know that governors from our state, North Carolina, as well as Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, and Delaware met to discuss this problem, and I'm especially pleased to see that the committee has taken the time to look at this today. Because of the unfortunate concern when we do not know enough about the potential impact of this problem, we need to give it the critical attention it needs. And as my good friend Mr. Towns, who is also an original native of North Carolina and of my area that I come from, we share in the concern nationwide and up and down our coast about this problem that is so critical to the health of our rivers and lakes and streams and also, of course, to human beings. This, if anything, is a wonderful opportunity for cooperative effort between federal, state, and local governments. I'm pleased to tell you that I am supporting the amendment to the House Commerce, Justice, and State Appropriations Bill that would bring three million additional dollars to effectively respond to this problem and to these conditions throughout the eastern seaboard. And with this cooperative effort, I believe we're in a position now that we can find a solution to this problem. I welcome those who have come again from North Carolina today. I appreciate this moment to be able to share our concerns and to let you know that you have our wholehearted support in working together on this problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, at this time, we'd uh, recognize a member of the committee, uh, Ms. Morella. If she has any opening statements or... Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's very important that you call this meeting. And I'm not on the subcommittee, but I'm on the full committee. But I wanted to particularly come here to show my support of the governor's efforts in the state of Maryland uh, to address the problem of hysteria, which affects all of us in the region. And I think it's a national problem. And uh, as my colleague has mentioned, there are several amendments, one that's been accepted and one that will be offered on the floor. And I'll be one of the co-sponsors with uh, Mr. Hoyer and Mr. Gilchrist and Mr. Uh, Cardin for additional monies to be put into, uh, into this particular study. And um, Governor Glendening's uh, efforts to encourage the identification and to have the summit 
of the various governors is certainly commendable. And I stand here, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, to do everything I can to make sure that we take care of that terrible blight. Thank you. I, th I thank the gentlewoman. And this time, I'd call on uh, Mr. Allen, a member of the committee, if you'd just like to uh, opening statement or you brief, don't have anyone to greet here, do you, from North Carolina and <laughs> Maryland? Or? Not from Maine, no. <laughs> but I will say, as a, yet. As, as a member from a coastal state, I am acutely aware of how interconnected our coastal waterways and our oceans are to the conditions that we live on on the land. And we have had incidents, similar kinds of incidents involving red tide up in Maine that have affected our uh, uh, clamming industries. And so I have a great deal of sympathy for, for those uh, populations in those states where that are, that are now undergoing this hysteria um, eco, eco, uh, epidemic. And I just want to say that I, I will do everything I can to help uh, make sure that the federal response is appropriate uh, to the scale of the problem and uh, support the states involved in any way that I can. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoyer, you're the senior member from the delegation here. We're going to let you speak last and introduce the governor. And this time we'll call on uh, Ms. Cl uh, Clayton, who is uh, welcome your statement and welcome you here today as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member of uh, this committee, by the way, who other have noted is from North Carolina, who I have the distinction of representing his hometown. Um, <laughs> we are uh, also excited about the number of persons who are here. Fisteria has plagued North Carolina for many years, and some experts now think the organism was first observed in our waters almost 20 years ago in 1978. While the old Northwest state has made multiple efforts to address this pestilence through actuary studies, non-discharge rule, phosphate bans, rapid response team, nitrogen load reduction, nutrient limit reduction, source wetland, restoration programs, and now a two-year moratorium on new and expanded swine farm. Festuary is an enigma for us all, as it has been found in many Atlantic waters, from Chesapeake Bay south to Florida, west to Texas. We must work together constructively and effectively, federal, state, local government, and agencies, academic research, concerned citizens, to attack and find rapid and workable solution to this predicament. I am pleased to note that several officials from North Carolina, who have already said they will be properly introduced later. We also will hear testimony from Dr. Joanne um, Burkholder, who we proudly claim in North Carolina. Through her diligent research, we now know a great deal about the organisms itself and its life cycle. All of us owe her a great debt of gratitude for her tireless work, which put her at great physical risk for illness. Now it is time to fund additional work for Dr. Burkholzel and other scientists and research like her in order to answer the remaining question regarding the effects of hysteria to, on humans, animals, and watershed. The waters of North Carolina have certainly felt the effect of hysteria outbreak, especially in the Neuse River, the Tar River, the Pamico River, as well as the entire Albemarle Pamico actuaries, part of which is in my congressional districts. There have been more than a million fish killed reported in our state and many reports of human health problems. Given the adverse impact of such significant fish kill upon my district, North Carolina, and the Mid-Atlantic, we need to seek solutions through aggressive research Mr. Chairman, we face a very serious threat that must be addressed immediately. We should not rush to judgment, however. Scientific inquiries are ongoing, but we should not waste time. Further research and testing should be undertaken at once. It is my hope that the funding for critical and needed research and testing will come as a result of today's hearing and other amendments that have been introduced already, which I also support. Only through funding will come the opportunity for solution. All North Carolinians, including Governor James B. Hunt and others who live, work, recreate in the affected waters, share that hope. Their lives and their livelihood depend upon it. I will not be able to stay through the hearing, but I look forward to the reading about it. I must attend a markup in the Agriculture Committee where I have asked the chairman to insert the language into the chairman in block amendment authorized specifically for fisteria research through our agriculture research arm. However, I am awaiting uh, the testimony of many of you who will go forward. Thank you for bringing your testimony. We look forward again, Mr. Chairman. We thank you for allowing us all to participate. Well, it's nice to have you here. And at this time, I'd uh, call on uh, Mr. Gilchrist, uh, who has uh, been
been very active in this issue for a while and was the first to ask if he could not only be here in the, in the beginning but participate in the entire hearing and welcome you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do thank you for allowing me to sit on the dais this morning and uh, participate in this um, most important, interesting, fascinating subject of uh, life in all its varied forms on planet Earth in the midst of an infinite hostile environment where we can't go anywhere to get away from this. Uh, so we've got to figure it out. Um, Steny Hoyer told me to say that, Mr. Chairman, so I thought I'd pass that along to you. He also told uh, you to say that the governor's doing an excellent job. Oh, did he tell me? To say? Oh, all right. Well, I was going to say that anyway, I think. Uh, I, I do want to say that, that the state's efforts in, in this um, uh, situation, actually starting last October when the state began to investigate some of the first reports, the state's efforts to have a, a summit, not only a summit of governors in, in recently, but, but the state's effort to have a summit of scientists down in the affected waters to collaborate and, and discuss what could be done and what would be the plan initiated to look at the problem. Do you look at water? Do you look at fish? Do you look at runoff? Do you look at air deposition? There's a whole range of, of scientific disciplines that are now converged on this particular problem. And, and I feel very secure about the progress and, is, and what is going on. And I can tell uh, the people here and the governor that whenever I travel around the district, whether I'm talking to watermen, just citizens, or farmers, that people are getting a sense uh, of the complexity of this issue, but the more information that goes out, they're getting a sense of security that the government is responding to this in a very intelligent way. And, and what we're responding to, interestingly enough, uh, I'm sure we'll hear from some of the scientists today, and Dr. Burkholder, welcome to the nation's capital and the U.S. Congress. Um, I think what we're trying to do is understand the mechanics of natural processes, one molecule at a time. In essence, the mechanics of creation. How does it all work and what is the human, human impact? Somebody recently told me that if you drive a car across South Dakota, it's not going to have much of an impact on the climate or the air or anything else. But look at the Beltway the Washington Beltway, the Baltimore Beltway, going to Ocean City in the summertime, that amount of traffic, that's air deposition. We, we say that we're in, we have instituted over the last 20 years, last 30 years, some incredible, um, some, some incredible legislation to secure the quality of the water, uh, the quality of the food, all these mechanisms to make our impact less wetlands legislation, buffers for farmers, we've cleaned up sewage treatment plants, a whole range of things. The problem is that one car across South Dakota, I don't, I'm going to finish up here, Mr. Chairman, isn't a problem. But then when you get the Beltway, we've increased in population. I've talked to farmers about the problems of instituting new regulations, mandatory regulations, and basically what the response from the farmers is that they've instituted new, new management techniques for the last 20 years, and this is one more step in the right direction. We need regional effort, s national efforts, and basically we need an international effort in understanding what the next frontier is. And the next frontier is an intellectual frontier to understand the mechanics of natural processes so we can continue to live on planet Earth. Thank I, you, I thank Chairman. the gentleman. We're, uh, this is the intent, Governor. If we have a roll call vote, we're going to have someone stay here, and you're not going to have to wait again. I'm getting a little nervous. We're getting more members coming in, but uh, we have some very distinguished members, including uh, Mr. Hefner. We're going to call on you in a second, but uh, to have a senior veteran like you come here to this committee is a distinguished privilege. Uh, Mr. Etheridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I promise you I will be brief. Yeah. Uh, I'm honored to be here, and I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to sit in today on what I think is a very important hearing on Fisteria. And certainly in North Carolina alone, over one billion fish have been killed as a result of this organism. And I want to thank you for the hearing. I think it's important. It's important to all of us on the East Coast and all of us really in this country. People who have been in contact with this organism, it's toxic, have become ill and suffered short-term memory loss, and m many of us have seen that, and I look forward to hearing part of the hearing today. I, like my uh, colleague, Ms. Clayton, will not be able to stay for the whole thing because we have a science meeting 
going on right now. Fisturia has now resulted in fish kills in Maryland and in Virginia and has become a genuine health concern for more than a half a dozen states from Delaware to Florida. It is vital that we learn more about what causes Fisturia and its potential impact on public health. Mr. Chairman, I commend you for holding this hearing and, and thank you very much. It's a clear recognition that this issue has taken on national significance. I also want to commend my colleagues in the House for approving $7 million in the recently passed appropriation bill for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to uh, develop an emergency response plan to monitor and research and react to the public health effects of hysteria. And Mr. Hefner, as one of our ranking members from North Carolina, I want to thank you for your leadership in that effort. Later today, the House will consider an amendment, as we've just heard, uh, on the Commerce and Justice and State Appropriations Bills to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to respond to this fisteria issue. And uh, Mr. Uh, I'm very proud to be a co-sponsor of that. It will have an impact in dealing with the conditions on the eastern seaboard that the governor is here to talk about and many of my colleagues from North Carolina. And I urge all of us to support that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for an opportunity. And thank you, to gentlemen. Have Another a gentleman, comments. North Carolina, the distinguished gentleman, Mr. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for those kind words. Uh, I would just like to thank you for having this hearing and Mr. Gilchrist's statement talking about uh, the things that uh, we need to do. And this is something that we do as a government, as a people, that uh, comes sometimes gets overlooked with all the adverse comments you hear around across the country but this is something we do because that's who we are and mr chairman i want to thank you for your leadership in this area and i'll by the way also i support your position on campaign financing too <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have some very distinguished carolinians here and they'll be introduced a little bit later and governor i know that you are working very diligently to try to come to grips with this problem and I want to assure you that any way that we can help you, I, th I don't speak for Steny Hoyer, but we're on the Appropriations Committee, and we'll work very, very hard to work with all the governors and all the states that are affected, because this is a problem that when it affects one of us, it affects the least of us, it affects all of us. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me come in and uh, have a few words. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I think it's fairly clear that, Governor, uh, you and others have caught the attention of the United States government, and uh, that's why you see such a large number of people who wanted to be present. Uh, Mr. Kucinich uh, is a member of the committee, walked in, and was very willing to have others who weren't members of the committee speak before him. But if you just have some brief words, then we're going to go to Mr. Hoyer. And, Governor, you're on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm uh, glad that this committee is here to examine the recent outbreak of hysteria around the mid Atlantic seaboard, and I hope that this subcommittee will be able to provide. Uh, the people of Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, and, and other areas assistance in their effort to protect their waters. But more importantly, I hope that this subcommittee can take a hard look at the bigger picture. Non-point source pollution poses not only a threat to the people of uh, the Atlantic <coughs> seaboard and the mid-Atlantic area, but to Americans nationwide. The Clean Water Act has succeeded in reducing point source pollution. But we need to address the problem of non-point source pollution. The uh, Lowry-Gilchrist Amendment provides a good starting point in reestablishing funding for the Coastal Non-Point Pollution Control Program. But we must do more to ensure the safety and cleanliness of America's water supply. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Hoyer, uh, you have the distinct honor of introducing the, the governor of the great state of Maryland. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for giving uh, the governor and myself and others this opportunity to speak out on an issue that is critically important. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you will hear this morning from a governor who has made some very difficult decisions over the past several weeks. Some of his actions have been questioned, others have been outright opposed. However, one thing is clear. At the leadership of the governor uh, of our state, he has acted forthrightly, responsibly, and effectively to help protect the citizens not only of our state, but of all the states who share the waters of the Atlantic coast, uh, and limit the awesome damage that this tox toxic microbe has caused elsewhere along our seaboard. This committee will investigate how the states have responded to Fisteria 
and believe that you will find, I believe that you will find no better example of decisive action to combat this problem than, than under the leadership of our governor. Uh, and I think that's a bipartisan, as you can tell, uh, observation, uh, Mr. Chairman. Finally, I understand that later today you will hear from a panel of agencies of fed, uh, on the federal response to Fisteria. Congresswoman Clayton mentioned the Department of Agriculture and the Agricultural Hearing. I've talked to uh, Secretary Glickman, as has the Governor, uh, Eva, and that is a very com important and, uh, component of this uh, effort. The federal government has a responsibility to assist the states however possible in this fight, and it, w and it will be important that the Congress give the agencies the necessary tools to accomplish this task. Uh, that is why I, on behalf of all of you who have spoken about our amendment, uh, will seek to add, and we have the agreement of uh, Chairman Rogers and uh, Ranking Member Mollahan on the bill that's on the floor today to add a $3 million to NOAA's budget. Congressman Gilchrist, uh, Morella, and, and all of the North Carolinians, uh, uh, Floridians, South Carolinians, uh, Governor Castle, who is the only one from Delaware, and, and others will join in a bipartisan uh, way as we seek to ensure that NOAA, an agency with a scientific and technical know-how to help in this fight, has enough money to do so. Recently, Mr. Chairman, as you know, the House passed an amendment to the Labor, Health, and Human Services Appropriation Bill to add $7 million uh, to CDC's budget uh, for this purpose. Uh, Congressman Etheridge uh, spoke to that. This was an important step, and today will be yet another in the Congress's response to the ongoing critical problem confronting our people. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for this opportunity to introduce to you uh, uh, the governor of our state, uh, who has been the governor of our state uh, for the past uh, three and a half years, and in addition to that was county executive of the county in which I lived for 12 years prior to that, the only county executive to be reelected <laughs> in our county, uh, which shows you, uh, notwithstanding some things you may have read, the viability of our governor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Paris Glendenny. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Hoyer, if you want to stay there, I have to swear you in, so I'm going to... We swear on all our witnesses, you know, Governor, and so we'd ask you to stand. And if you think there's anyone else who's... Uh, that was supposed to be a joke, Mr. Hoyer. I, I, was going to, <laughs> I, I was going to respond. Everything I said was the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. For the record, the governor has responded in the affirmative. And let me just say, Governor, we swear in all our witnesses, even members of Congress, this is an investigative committee, and uh, that's our practice for everyone, as you know. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm going to get one piece of uh, housekeeping out of the way and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record, and the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. And I ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record without objection so ordered. And, Governor, you've waited so long. I'm not putting a time limit on you. I don't know if that's the way to go, but uh, you're going to have a green light that will continually uh, go green. You're on, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Although I must tell you, as a per person who taught for 27 years at the University of Maryland College Park, and my thoughts come in 55-minute segments as a well, result Governor, of that. I, may want to but, uh, I don't want to get the change. <laughs> but uh, I, I know how busy everyone is, and so I will be brief. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, thank you and members of the committee uh, for having this hearing and for being here today. Uh, it does uh, really illustrate that this is not just a Maryland problem. Uh, the governors coming together very rapidly indicated that uh, this was a regional problem, and uh, your quick response, the Congress's quick response, and the administration. Uh, shows that this is really a national challenge, and I want to thank you for your leadership on that as well. Thank you, Governor. I'm going to ask you to move the mic a little closer. It's, uh, we want to pick up your voice. Great. If you pull it up a little bit, I think it's a little harder to hear. Yeah, that's great. And turn a little towards the middle. I'm sorry to direct you like that. Great. Okay, are we, let's, I think we're picking up your voice better. Let me also, uh, as I uh, mentioned my uh, comments there, give a special thanks to uh, uh, Congressman Hoyer, uh, who's been a uh, leader in our congressional delegation for so long and his uh, absolute uh, prompt uh, response to this and the uh, partnership that uh, he illustrated earlier with the state of Maryland and the national government and uh, Congressman Gilchrist in particular, our uh, whole delegation has been very, very supportive and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, Connie uh, Wayne has been uh, out there in the field as well uh, trying to, to work on this and I certainly appreciate uh, your being here as well as uh, your support and your leadership. Let me, if I might, uh, 
uh, make just a few comments. I have submitted uh, written testimony, and so I will not uh, go into detail. And I know I'm followed by uh, a number of uh, scientists and, and medical experts, and so I'll leave the technical uh, stuff to them. We have tried to make our decisions based on health issues and science and medical research, and uh, that's why I'm so pleased that the team that you've assembled to, to make uh, testimony here today. Uh, Maryland faces a very serious problem. The Fisteria uh, impacts our citizen, our waterways, our, our economy, and even our way of life, and particularly when you think about the importance of the Chesapeake Bay in terms of what Maryland is. Uh, at the same time, I would note this is not a Maryland uh, problem, not just a Maryland problem. Uh, Fisteria-like organisms have been found in Virginia. Uh, North Carolina has been struggling with this problem now for almost uh, seven years. Delaware experienced a massive fish kill in uh, 1987, which we now believe, uh, as we accumulate knowledge on this, to have been uh, Fisteria. Uh, and just last week, we met with uh, four governors and representatives from two other states uh, because Fisteria does not know uh, anything about state boundaries. Uh, today, what I want to talk about is what we're doing in Maryland about Fisteria, uh, and particularly uh, how the federal government, how the federal partnership might help us and the other states. Uh, currently, Maryland is working towards several objectives. Uh, first, uh, and primary, I think, for all of our consideration, is we must protect the public health. Uh, second, we need to better understand what Fisteria is, and particularly what causes it to become toxic uh, and why it harms both fish and people. And I want to emphasize that last point because I think we passed over this uh, issue that it clearly uh, now demonstrates that it is a he human health problem as well. And third, we must ensure that we craft a solution for the problem of Fisteria, that we work to protect the interest uh, throughout our community. We are all in this together. Uh, this is not about pointing fingers either one state to another or one part of our community to another. The public, the watermen, the tourism industry, the farmers, the poultry growers, uh, the retail sales, we're all uh, in this together. Uh, first and foremost is the public health issue. First, the good news. Uh, our seafood is safe to eat. Uh, the seafood that you buy at the grocery store, or eat at the restaurant, uh, does not come from the affected waterways. Uh, it is absolutely safe to eat. Uh, in fact, I will be taking the entire Maryland cabinet out later this afternoon for rockfish lunch. Uh, and I guarantee you we'll all be at work tomorrow morning. Uh, now, uh, Sansar and members of the committee, if you wish to join us. Uh, since our first report... Governor, um, if you aren't well tomorrow, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> since our uh, first reports of sick fish and sick people, we have been working very aggressively. We have closed the impacted waterways to protect public health. We have established a blue ribbon Citizen Fisteria Committee, which is chaired by former Governor Harry Hughes, who are looking for long-term solutions but know the importance of this, and they will be reporting to us by November 1st of this year. We have also appropriated $2 million emergency funds for a state-only pro program to help uh, Maryland farmers with a winter cover crop. We have increased the monitors and inspection of our waterways. We have added funds uh, to educate the public about the safety of Maryland's seafood market. Now, while Maryland has taken decisive steps, the battle against Fisteria is bigger than any one state can tackle alone. We need your help. Uh, the federal government has already been responsive. Uh, we are working with uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore, uh, with EPA Administrator Carol Browner, uh, with the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman, uh, with the Maryland Congressional Delegation, and I specifically want to thank uh, the leadership of uh, Senator Sarbanes and Mikulski, uh, Congressman uh, Hoyer and Gilchrist, and the entire delegation uh, working together on this, and now uh, the support and involvement of the members here of this committee. The federal government has already provided $500,000 in emergency assist assistance from EPA and NOAA, an additional $100,000 from the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, uh, and uh, with the leadership of uh, Congressman Hoyer and, and uh, the involvement of our entire congressional delegation and the support of so many members here. As we know, $7 million of new money uh, was uh, appropriated uh, to the Centers for Disease Control to better understand the public health effects uh, of Fisteria. It is my understanding that the Center for Disease Control will be having a Fisteria conference next week in Atlanta uh, trying to get a better handle on this. I also want to uh, 
uh, indicate our strong support for the amendment that several members discussed that uh, Congressman Hoyer has uh, offered, uh, joined by many co-sponsors, uh, for the $3 million to NOAA's budget uh, to help to research the cause and the, and the formation of Fisteria. I appreciate the Federal response, uh, but let me also emphasize for both the State Government, for the Federal Government, there is so much more uh, that can be done. Uh, we need, for example, uh, to expand the national research effort to provide greater understanding of this toxic organism. It has been around for at least 10,000 years, and I said half in jest and half seriously, I don't know why it decided to go active and toxic right in the middle of my administration. <laughs> Uh, but uh, regardless of the timing, something is clearly triggering uh, this outbreak. Uh, we also need definitively to determine the impact that Fisteria is having on human health. And I would suggest that's probably the most uh, important issue that is before us, but also the impact on our environment and on our waterways. We need to help expand uh, throughout the uh, multi-state area our winter uh, crop cover efforts uh, as well as address the issue of seafood marketing for which so many families are dependent. Uh, we have to assist the states, if we will, in developing improved nutrient management practices as well as innovative waste management methods. Uh, and lastly, I would say we seek help in coordinating uh, multi-state responses. Just as a quick example, the largest source of water for the Chesapeake Bay is the Susquehanna River. The Susquehanna River uh, starts in upstate New York, flows through New York, uh, through Pennsylvania uh, be, and through Maryland before it empties into the Chesapeake uh, uh, Bay. I also want to emphasize, by the way, this is not, uh, as the committee clearly knows, partisan or anything like this, because uh, I saw uh, Governor Ridge step right up, where they're not having a Fisteria outbreak. And Governor Ridge of Pennsylvania said, I understand that the water source for the Bay comes through Pennsylvania, and I want to be part of the solution. And I, I appreciate that type of effort. Finally, we must work uh, cooperatively to aid those farmers and watermen and poultry growers, as well as private citizens whose livelihood are being adversely impacted in a very major way by the recent outbreaks of Fisteria. Let me note that in the 1960s, pollution of the Potomac River became a national symbol for why we needed the Clean Water Act. Last week, EPA Administrator Carol Browner observed that Fisteria outbreak was really a clarion call about our nation's waterway. I agree with that. You know, my father used to tell me a story that I'm sure many people have heard about how the miners in West Virginia used to take canaries into the mine. And when the canary died, they knew they had a serious problem and they immediately fled the mine because of poisonous gas. Uh, our fish are dying in the same way uh, to tell us we have a very serious problem in our environment. Uh, it is not confined to one area. Uh, it is not just about what is happening in the water. Uh, it is about human health. Uh, with cold uh, weather coming on, Fisteria outbreaks are likely to dis de uh, diminish. Next spring, uh, in almost certainty, they will return and they will return with a vengeance. Uh, obviously, we must act now. Uh, I would make uh, two quick observations uh, in conclusion. One uh, is that the problem in the water clearly starts on the land. Uh, our solution is going to be on the land, and it's not going to be an easy solution. We're going to have to take decisive action. I believe it will be expensive. Uh, I believe it's going to take some political courage for us to require what must be done. Uh, secondly, no one state is going to be able to handle this by ourselves. We are working regionally. The governors are very enthusiastic about the outcome of the conference, the summit we had just recently. Uh, but we do need a full uh, partnership with the federal government, uh, and this is a major a step to do exactly that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Governor. Governor, your statement was worth waiting for. You clearly have a uh, nice way of uh, making a presentation and educating this committee. I, I'd, I'd say to you two things. First, um, it isn't a partisan issue, and even on this committee, we keep the gavel between Mr. Towns and me. I use my right hand, and he uses his <laughs> left, but we, either one can pick up this gavel. Um, and I'd also say that uh, uh, we sometimes think Republicans in the Northeast are the canaries in the mind, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'd like to know, um, uh, in general, if you were to outline to Congress what you would want us to do and what you would want the, the President to do to help you and other governors and other state legislatures deal with this problem. I think the most pressing issue by far 
is the need for really basic research, the type of research that one state by itself has a difficult time undertaking. It's a center for disease control. It's support for our major universities and other research centers. We must know uh, on a serious level, I joked about it before, but why something has been around for at least 10,000 years has already has become so toxic. We must know what it is that we, mankind, is doing to cause that. Uh, secondly, uh, we have some immediate uh, short-term needs. Uh, for example, uh, we are putting up emergency funding, uh, state-only dollars, uh, for a winter crop uh, 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 overplanning uh, to try to help prevent the nutrient runoffs. And we're also making a number of other emergency expenditures to deal with the immediacy of the problem. Uh, lastly, as we come to a conclusion about what is causing this, there are going to be costs associated with it. Maryland is willing, obviously, to, to, to clearly share in these, in these costs. Uh, but whether they are preventing animal waste runoff, uh, whether they are upgrading some of the smaller water and sewage treatment plants, uh, or whether there are significant changes in the way we do either agriculture or urban non-point source pollution, uh, we've got to be candid and honest here. It's going to cost money. And to the extent that we're working together and heading in the same direction uh, and sharing that burden, it would be very helpful. But uh, I suppose, number one, uh, we need help in telling us what, exactly what we're dealing with. Thank you. I'm going to, we, we may have a vote soon, and we're not going to hold you up for the vote. We're going to complete our task. I'd call Mr. Towns and uh, see the gentleman has the floor. And excuse me, I, I didn't uh, introduce uh, David Price, who has joined uh, this, uh, this committee. I'm sorry, David. It's nice to have you here. You just fit in so well. I thought you'd been here for a while. So I don't know if you'd like to just make a, a statement uh, uh, and would welcome that. I'd like to like. yield to him. Yes, that'd be nice. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I commend you and the entire uh, subcommittee for uh, convening this hearing today and will uh, look forward to appreciate uh, the leadership of our Maryland colleagues on, on this issue and, and look forward to helping welcome our North Carolina panel, which will, will come next. Thank you, so thank you for your hospitality and for the work you're doing to help us understand and, and legislate effectively in this area. Great to have you here, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. And it's good to have you here, too. Uh, and all the other members that have joined us on this very serious matter. Uh, let me begin by saying, uh, um, Governor, we appreciate your leadership as well. Do you believe that the public should have any concern about the recreational contact with the water? I do. Uh, where there is an active Vesteria outbreak, uh, we ha now have fairly clear evidence uh, that it does cause health problems on contact. You'll be hearing from the medical team later, but in quick summary, that health contact is uh, external. It does appear to cause either s skin irritation or lesions. Uh, internally, it is everything from respiratory problems to pretty clear evidence of neurological problems. The good news is that the toxin portion that causes that metal medical problem appears to uh, dissipate very rapidly. Uh, but that is the reason the moment we found out about these medical, human medical links, uh, that we decided to inform the public and to close those particular rivers. Right. Let me ask, on the state level, being there's some other states that are affected by this as well, uh, can you tell us what kind of voluntary solutions may be available to reduce pollutants which could have a role in causing hysteria? Well, there are a number of voluntary actions uh, already uh, underway uh, in uh, uh, the Lower Eastern Shore for Maryland. Uh, we have made major efforts uh, with regard to agriculture, uh, best management practices, and a variety of things like this, uh, the winter crop uh, planting that we talked about. Uh, it is increasingly clear, however, to many people, and I'm waiting for the Blue Ribbon Commission for definitive word on this, that in some uh, areas we will probably uh, need uh, to be more aggressive, and that is there will probably need to be some mandatory standards and, and ways to achieve those standards. Well, let me assure you that this member is willing to work with you in every way that we possibly can uh, to make certain that this situation that we see now uh, is diminished in every way, and in fact eliminated. And I think that if we put the money into research, I think that we can do it. So I want to thank you again for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Yield this back, time we'd uh, recognize another member of the committee, Mr. Allen. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governor, I uh, congratulate you on your efforts and wish you well in what you 
what lies in front of you. I, I'd really be interested, I, I realize there's been some cooperation already between governors in different states that have been affected by this outbreak. What, what more needs to be done? How, how can the governors of the different states uh, work together? And what kind of intergovernmental cooperation do we need here and in what particular areas in order to make sure that different states are not working at cross purposes? Right. Uh, in the short run, and, and this is largely what came out of the uh, uh, summit, uh, the decision was made to put together uh, technical teams uh, to make sure that we're exchanging information because uh, there's so much we do not know about the current situation. Uh, secondly, to uh, put a protocol together for exchange of medical information, uh, and particularly the challenges of giving specific information and still protecting uh, patient privacy. Uh, and third, uh, to have a, a network for uh, quick uh, exchange of emergency uh, like basis uh, when and where additional outbreaks uh, either occur or are suspected and then lastly to try to come up with unified uh, efforts to work in partnership with the federal government. In the long run uh, it may well be that if we uh, determine clearly uh, the nature of the runoff problem of the nutrient loading problem that is causing this uh, that we would try to uh, work together on a regional basis uh, to have similar policies to reduce uh, that uh, runoff. Uh, as an example, let us assume that uh, it is, as many people are saying, animal waste. Uh, even if Maryland uh, eliminated 100 percent of the animal waste, uh, it would not be effective unless uh, similar efforts were ongoing in states that feed that, that waterway. So between the federal partnership and the state regional cooperation, uh, those are the directions we're looking. How, how how confident are you at this stage that it is animal waste, or at least that that's a major factor? Or how, how, how far down the road are we in terms of understanding the causes? I think we can say with certainty that it is uh, coming from the land, so it is a runoff issue. That, that is certain. Uh, it is uh, probably at the 98, 99% certainty that it is some type of uh, nutrient overload that is coming from the land. Uh, there is uh, a lot of... Uh, of um, evidence and common sense uh, uh, direction that suggests while there are many causes, uh, urban runoff, uh, water and sewer treatment plants, uh, agriculture, but uh, that the uh, animal waste uh, does seem to be causing the phosphorus uh, overload, uh, which uh, many researchers are pointing to as a major part of the problem. Now, I would make a quick observation uh, to wrap up that question, and that is, I'm not sure we're going to know in a really timely fashion, 100 percent, that this is absolutely the case. However, uh, I do think we have to take the best evidence available, uh, combine it with some good common sense, and start to take actions to correct uh, the problem. Uh, and we intend to do that uh, uh, as a result of the uh, commission that we appointed in November, which will probably lead to legislation uh, come uh, the next session in January. My last question, uh, just following up on what you're saying about phosphorus being a component, uh, any, any uh, connection between uh, fertil with fertilizers? I mean, is that also a piece of the problem? Uh, in, uh, on the Lower Eastern Shore, uh, interestingly, the chicken uh, manure uh, is one of the major sources of fertilizer, which is also then disproportionately uh, phosphorus uh, loaden, uh, laden. So, uh, <clears throat> that when they use the regular fertilizers, including, by the way, we're all in this together, as I say, uh, a suburban uh, fertilizer on our lawns are part of the problem. We've got to understand that. Uh, but uh, uh, the most pointed uh, does seem to suggest at the moment that the disproportionate increase in phosphorus is coming from uh, animal waste. Okay. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. At this time, would call on uh, Ms. Morella, the distinguished member from your delegation. Governor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate uh, Governor Glendening being here, um, as well as the others from our neighboring states who are going to be testifying, because we are in it together, as you've mentioned, as the summit represents. And, you know, collectively we can come up with a strategy which will happen, but uh, there will obviously be some barriers th because one size doesn't always fit all in terms of differences. Uh, among the various states, and I, I just wonder, would you like to comment on what you see as the potential barriers to the common program um, of uh, protective actions and how we might handle those? 
Well, I think part of the problem is, of course, uh, you're absolutely right, and there's probably not one solution out there. Mm. Uh, different um, uh, runoff problems are causing different reactions in different rivers in different states. Uh, just as an example, when I talked to uh, Governor Hunt uh, in uh, North Carolina, uh, part of his observation was about the whole animal waste issue from the tremendous hog farm, uh, size to hog farms there. And uh, the North Carolina uh, government and legislature, of course, is starting to take actions on exactly that. Uh, we don't have these mega ho uh, hog farms. It's not part of our issue here. Some science is also starting to point to uh, that the rivers themselves uh, vary greatly, in part just simply because of the, the uh, uh, how fast the current runs and that you have different problems based mm -hmm. on all of that. Uh, I think what uh, we need is the knowledge of what causes this outbreak and other, uh, as, as Congressman Gilchrist said, other uh, uh, microorganisms, because I think this is probably just one of a whole cluster of problems we're having from our water pollution, and then uh, a general assistance uh, so we can work in partnership, and then each state coming in uh, with its own targeted program uh, that really tries to deal with whatever uh, the, the bottom line is. Uh, I think we, we've got to reduce the nutrient levels in the water from whatever source in every state if we're not going to go through a, a, a continuing explosion of these outbreaks, not just Fisteria and not just in the eastern shore. Uh, this, this is the canary, and, and uh, we've got to, I think, respond very aggressively. Mm -hmm. We have that, that goal in mind and uh, the uh, uh, actions that we can take collectively and then recognition of individual differences. Uh, but working out toward that goal. Just one final uh, question in terms of how do you establish the threshold where there is the public health problem? Um, I, I guess scientifically, but how do you establish it when we must all get involved in terms of um, trying to remedy it, come up with a solution? Well, this is one of the reasons we're looking uh, to the federal government in terms of the tremendous research capacity that is available here as well as support for the private uh, institutions. Uh, we all have to make our individual decision. When I made the decision to release the public information about the health issue uh, and to close the rivers, uh, I made that decision based on a relatively small sample but very clear uh, Evidence. I mean, when you look at the, the pictures or the individuals with the skin lesions, but uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, of uh, five individuals that they did a brain-type uh, scan, uh, three of them uh, showed a toxic uh, film uh, over that portion of the brain that deals with the memory uh, portions, and Dr. Morris is here to talk more detail about this, uh, but uh, as governor, not as, not as a medical doctor, uh, I'm sitting there looking at this and saying uh, something uh, health-wise, mm -hmm. very serious, is obviously going on, and uh, I couldn't wait uh, two years while we do uh, definitive uh, studies. I had to both let the public know uh, as well uh, as, as uh, take immediate actions. I think we're basically in that position, and, and uh, if, um, if we have reasonable evidence that this is a serious health problem, at a minimum, We've got to close the water and, and uh, let the public know what's going on. And then we've got to take that extra step and get definitive evidence one way or the other and how to deal with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So initially you also made a judgment, and then the scientists will enter into the, into the picture. Yes, the judgment, by the way, was based on there were people who said, well, uh, perhaps you should not release this wondered. information yeah. right now and all. My thought was, and it was difficult because this was the weekend before Labor Day with the tourism and everything else, but my thought was, how would I feel if I had this reasonable evidence of a serious health problem mm -hmm. and, I, and I sat on that information uh, for the weekend, uh, for several months, for several years, uh, while we talked about it or while we did additional research, and particularly how would I feel if families were out in those rivers uh, water skiing uh, if people uh, subsequently got to serious uh, neurological uh, disorders, as some apparently do, and then I, and then I said, well, I knew that at the time, uh, but wanted to be safer in my conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason to respond when I did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. I, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, Mr. Gilchrist, you, you're going to end up with a question, and then we're going to go vote. And, Governor, you'll be all set. Thank you. 
I, I don't really have a question right now, Mr. Chairman, because we've been uh, working on this for, for, for months now. Um, it is a very complex problem, and when Mr. Allen makes an address, uh, is it the phosphorus, is it the farm runoff, I think the governor has gi given a very adequate response uh, that we need to deal with the scientific information about all these issues and then understand that uh, if it is farms, for example, and this is a difficult issue on the Lower Eastern Shore because agriculture is the dominant industry. If it is farms, and I've talked to a number of farmers, these farmers understand that this is probably going to be the next step to improve best management practices. And in most cases, Governor, the farmers are ahead of the politicians on this issue. So I think that we, we need to move forward very clearly. We need to work with the Department of Agriculture, with the research dollars, EPA. The Smithsonian Institute has a number of good people as far as soil scientists are concerned to understand the nature of including phosphorus in a nutrient management plan along with nitrogen. Now, to non-farmers in this room, it doesn't sound very dramatic. But if you're a farmer, saying that is extremely dramatic. But the gov governor, I want to thank you for saying that we're going to work to make this happen so everybody benefits. So to a certain extent, we will have clean fish and we still eat the chickens. Right. Thank you very much, Governor. <laughs> governor, thank you so much. It's sure. really been an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Mr. Chairman, you, committee members, thank you yeah, for your you've leadership. Set, thank you've, you. you've started the hearing off well, put the ball in play, and we thank you. Thank you. We're at recess. Thank you, Chris. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you. Sheena, okay. We're going to call our witnesses uh, to the front desk. Joanne Burkholder, PhD, Department of Marine Sciences and Aquatic Botany, North Carolina State University. J. Glenn Morris, MD, University of Maryland School of, Mer of Medicine. David Bruton, MD, Secretary of Health and Human Service, State of North Carolina. Wayne McDevitt, Secretary of Environment and Natural Resources, State of North Carolina. Randolph Gordon, MD, Commissioner of the Department of Health, Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, Rodney Barker, an author of four books. We have our witnesses before us, and I would ask uh, uh, each of you to stand up. We do swear you in. Now, let me ask you, is there anyone, before raising your right uh, arm, is there anyone that you might be calling to respond to a particular question? If so, I would like them to stand up. And if we call on them, uh, we'll, um, we'll ask that they identify themselves. Just this saves us doing it twice. So if you would all raise your, your right arms, right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, sir. Thank you. For the record, uh, all our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Um, and. Um, Mr. Hefner, uh, I'd love to just give you the floor to uh, welcome one of our guests or guests. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
It's a real pleasure, as I said earlier, to be here with you, and I have such respect for your record on the environment and uh, Mr. Gilchrist, who is uh, in the forefront for his environment and environmental issues. And it's uh, a privilege to be here to talk about this uh, parasite known as Visteria. And uh, Dr. Joan Burkholter, associate uh, professor of botany at North Carolina State University, is a country's leading expert on Visteria. And Mr. Price will officially introduce you a little bit later. Wayne McDevitt, Secretary of North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources, has served under Governor Hunt in various capacities since 1984. He has a solid background on environmental issues, having served as regional manager of the Department of Human Resources and Community Development in Asheville, North Carolina, a member of Governor's Waste Management Board, chaired his County Board of Health, and in 1994, he was named by U.S. Trade Representative Mickey Canner to the Trade Environmental Policy Advisory Council. Prior to being named to his current post, he was a senior advisor to the governor on environmental, uh, inter-environmental governmental relations. Uh, Dr. David Bruton uh, has been a friend of mine, or he's been a friend of mine, I don't know if I've been a friend of his, but for the better part of over 30 years, when I first ran for Congress, he was uh, in uh, Pinehurst in Moore County and through redistricting, and uh, I have represented him a couple of times, but right now I do not represent him. But he has an outstanding resume, and I will not go through all of the uh, things that send this, uh, his resume because he's just a decent human being, and his primary purpose over the years has been to look after children. He's a pediatrician. He's a very distinguished member from, of the medical profession, and we certainly appreciate your, your work that you're doing, Dr. Bruton. And uh, we're just happy to have you here. And I don't know if, if David, I guess you're going to officially uh, introduce uh, the, the good doctor here. But we want to welcome you here on behalf of the great state of North Carolina, which we have had our share of disasters. And as Mr. Gilchrist and some of them mentioned earlier, this is when I think is, as a government and as a nation, these are some of our under very uh, bad circumstances. These are our finest hours when we come to each other's aid and whether it be hurricanes, where it be Oklahoma City bombings, or where it be Mount Helens eruption in Washington State. We're out, we're at our best when we come to the aid of all the citizens across this country. And it just points out to me, there's a lot of people that says that government doesn't have a function in people's lives, but I'm just proud when the government comes to the aid of people and works, and the chairman and all the committees work so hard to try to put together and find an answer to things that trouble us all. And we're just happy to have you folk with us here today. And I would officially introduce Dr. Burton and Mr. McDevitt, and David later or now will uh, do his introduction. Thank you for coming, and uh, I'm going to be interested in your testimony. Thank you very much. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. Uh, of course, I want to add my welcome to our two cabinet secretaries from North Carolina, uh, Secretaries Bruton and McDevitt, as well as our friends and colleagues from uh, Maryland and Virginia, the other states uh, involved in this uh, common endeavor. Uh, my uh, special assignment here this morning, and it's a pleasure to do this, uh, is to introduce uh, Dr. Joanne Burkholder, one of the witnesses and uh, the pioneer researcher on Fisteria in the United States. Uh, as, as the subcommittee is well aware and as uh, Representative Hefner has stated, Fisteria was first identified by Dr. Joanne Burkholder of North Carolina State University. Uh, we in North Carolina know her as a fine researcher and as a courageous spokesperson for environmental protection and for the public health. Dr. Bur Burkholder has served North Carolina well, uh, tirelessly campaigning for improved water quality. Her groundbreaking work has helped us better understand a problem that has plagued North Carolina since the 1980s, the mysterious death of millions of fish with sores in the Noose, Pamlico, and New Rivers. Now, those who know uh, Dr. Burkholder uh, confirm that she never stops working. She sometimes puts in 20-hour uh, 20, 20 days that begin in her Raleigh lab, move to the coast, and end up back in the lab. She's also found time to serve on numerous appointed bodies, including the Marine Fisheries Commission, where she was instrumental in showing state policymakers that the health of the fisheries resource is directly tied to the health of our estuaries. 
At North Carolina State University, Dr. Burkholder is known as both an outstanding researcher and an outstanding teacher. She's worked at State since 1986, teaching classes in aquatic and plant ecology. She's received numerous uh, national awards, including a Pew Fellowship. Dr. Burkholder received her undergraduate degree from uh, Iowa State, master's uh, degree from University of Rhode Island, and a doctorate from Michigan State University. She's lived and worked across much of the country, but she is in North Carolina now and we're going to do everything we can to keep her. So welcome, Dr. Burkholder. Uh, we uh, are pleased to have you here today, and uh, it's, it's my pleasure to present you to our colleagues on this subcommittee. I thank the gentleman. And Mr. Etheridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. And I, like my other two colleagues who are here from North Carolina, welcome this distinguished panel and two members of the governor's uh, cabinet being here, both of whom I have known for many years. Uh, Dr. Bruton has, has uh, Congressman Hefner has pointed out, uh, has had a distinguished career uh, in the private sector, but he didn't limit it there. He was always involved in the public sector in one way or another over the years, and we're grateful to have you here. And I'm glad you chose to move to the public sector. Uh, I was one of those people that encouraged him to do it, uh, as did many others, and we're glad to have you. And Wayne McDevitt, whom I've worked with many years, and uh, Congressman Hefner has already touched on many of the areas he served in. He, he, he in North Carolina, along with David Bruton, be two of the point people who will be responsible for this major effort. And we're glad to have you here. We look forward to your testimony today <coughs> and, and, more importantly, the good work that both of you are going to be doing. Uh, and certainly your agencies, but certainly yours, Wayne, will be the point agency in this. And we look forward to that because I think in North Carolina it has been an issue for a long time. And as C Congressman Hefner has pointed out, this is an opportunity to build a tremendous partnership uh, that we do in times of crisis. We did it in recently as 13, 14 months ago when Fran came through. And now we have another opportunity to do the same thing, to make a difference for the health and safety of our people, not only in North Carolina, but up and down the eastern seaboard and across this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Um I have two anxieties, one another vote, and the other is that sitting in the dais, I notice that three of our uh, witnesses have been uh, formally welcomed. I'll also welcome our witnesses from Maryland and Virginia. And also, um, uh, a, a, I, this is a requirement, a personal relationship of someone on the panel. I grew up with uh, the author here, Rod Barker, and uh, in uh, fifth grade, um, uh, we were playing a game of touch football, and he started to taunt me, so I attempted to tackle Rod. And I, I did, and uh, nearly locked out one of my teeth. I chipped the bottom part of my teeth. Still there, Rod. Thanks a lot. And the only, the only problem I had with it was, one, you got away, and two, you laughed at me when we were done. <laughs> we're going to start with you, Ms. Burkholder. And I think if we can get your testimony down, we'll, we'll be grateful. And if one or two members, no, I think we need to hear your testimony. Why don't you just begin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee members, for asking me to come and provide some advice and some guidance on this issue. The toxic dinoflagellate Fisteria piscicida is a one-celled animal that was first found as a fish culture contaminant at North Carolina State University. It was first identified in the wild during 1991 as an agent of major fish kills in North Carolina's Albemarle Pamlico estuary. This estuary contributes half of the surface area used as nursery grounds for fish from Maine to Florida and it is the second largest estuary after the Chesapeake on the U.S. mainland. When we first found Fisteria piscicida, I predicted that multiple species would be identified with similar appearance and toxic behavior toward fish. Two other Fisteria-like toxic species are now known from the mid-Atlantic or southeast. These species have been discerned on the basis of slight differences in cell structure. Genetic composition and cross-reproduction studies are needed to confirm that they're separate species. The only one that has been named so far is Fisteria piscicida, so these dinoflagellates are loosely known as the toxic Fisteria complex. Fisteria-like species are usually benign little animals that consume other microbes and dissolved organic nutrients. They become toxic when they detect high levels of substances excreted by fish. Optimal conditions for toxic Fisteria activity are poorly flushed, quiet brackish waters, and warm temperatures. In the past seven years in North Carolina, we have lost more than a billion finfish and shellfish from kills and disease related to Fisteria piscicida and at least one other toxic Fisteria-like dinoflagellate. This year, these dinoflagellates also have affected about 50,000 fish from some areas of Chesapeake Bay. 
With help from the National Marine Fisheries Service, Charleston's Marine Biotoxin Center, and the NIEHS intramural program, a major neurotoxin has been isolated that can kill test fish in five minutes. Medical evidence implicates Feasteria piscicida in serious human health impacts uh, for 10 people from several laboratories who worked with toxic cultures. The main route of exposure was direct contact with culture water or inhalation of airborne toxins. The toxin cell densities were within the range found at fish kills in our estuaries. The affected people worked with these cultures, which were just several small aquaria, only for one to two hours per day for about five to six weeks. The exposures we obtained in the laboratory were certainly within range of potential field exposures. Symptoms included narcosis, eye irritation, erratic respiratory distress, stomach cramping and vomiting as initial effects. Other effects including skin lesions, severe headaches, profound learning disabilities, and short-term memory loss lasted for weeks to months. Although most symptoms have reversed, some have recurred for years following exposure. In supporting studies, colleagues at Duke University have shown that exposure to Feasteria's toxins can cause sustained learning disabilities in experimental small mammals, uh, rats. In North Carolina's estuaries, people who have been in toxic outbreak areas have reported skin lesions, tingling or burning sensation, sporadic memory loss and disorientation, learning disabilities, eye irritation, and chronic respiratory infections. Frequently, these symptoms have lessened or disappeared following weeks or months away from the affected areas. Similar health problems have been reported by people who have been in fish disease or fish kill areas in Maryland's Pocomoke estuary. It should be emphasized that similar species of toxic fusteria-like dinoflagellates were involved as those which occur in North Carolina. The impacts of toxic fusteria piscicida and its close allies is an issue that I care deeply about and have worked to understand for nearly a decade. I am grateful to my admi university administration for their faith and support, to sources such as the National Science Foundation, the United States Marine Air Station at Cherry Point, and the Environmental Protection Agency and others for funding that has helped to sustain my research program, and to the fishermen and their families and the concerned citizens who have helped to make it possible for this research to continue through adverse times. I have talked about the biology of these organisms and what I know about their impacts on human health as both a victim of their toxins and a laboratory director. But a more central message needs to be related here. The toxic Feasteria complex commonly thrives in areas affected by nutrient pollution. They, as well as other harmful microorganisms, appear to be increasing in coastal areas where urbanization, agriculture, and other human activities are threatening the health of our aquatic ecosystems. The story of Feasteria serves to illustrate that in coastal areas where so many of us live, Fish health and human health are strongly linked. It is my hope that through knowledge of Feasteria and other harmful species, we can come to a greater appreciation of the need to take better care of our coastal waters toward protecting both our fisheries and our own health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burkholder. You're not only a very good scientist, but you are a very perseverant person for which we are all grateful. Uh, Dr. Morris, we're going to uh, start with your testimony. We may have to end. Mr. Pappas left a little earlier, so we won't have as big a break. It might just be a, a four or five minute break, but why don't you begin? And uh, for the members, we have about uh, ten minutes, uh, nine minutes until. Do we want to begin? Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it's a pleasure having an opportunity to testify here today. Um, actually, the last time I sat before this committee, I was testifying as director of the Epidemiology and Emergency Response Program at FSIS at USDA. Uh, much to my pleasure, I'm now back full-time at University of Maryland and um, am currently a professor of medicine at University of Maryland, which is the role I testify in today. The story, in, so far as Maryland, was, Maryland is concerned, started in the fall of 1996, when fishermen working on the Maryland eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay began to see fish with unusual punched-out lesions and erratic behavior. They also began to note symptoms of fatigue, skin and respiratory irritation, and memory problems. These problems continued through the spring and summer of 1997, culminating in the major fish kills which occurred in the Pocomoke River at the end of the summer. At the same time, these fish kills raised a number of public concerns about public health effects due to contact with river water or affected fish. At that point, the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene asked the two medical schools in Maryland to assemble a team of physicians to examine people with health complaints. And basically, the question which was asked was, is there something going on? Is there a real human health effect associated with exposure? 
Um, as I was the leader of the team, uh, we had a team of five physicians, doctors from University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins. I can tell you that I had a great deal of skepticism. In fact, uh, we all went down uh, to the Eastern Shore in a, in a van uh, on August 22nd. I spent half, half an hour on the way down explaining how our role was to decrease the hysteria which was being caused by fisteria and that I was sure that we were not hysteria going to Hysteria versus fisteria. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> and I was sure that we would not find anything. Um, I will tell you after examining about the seventh or eighth patient, we started looking at each other saying, hey guys, there is something here. And by the time we finished with patient number 13, uh, we were pretty well convinced. Since that time, uh, we have examined an additional eight control watermen on September 6th and 7th, and an additional 15 persons with varying degrees of water exposure on September 12th. Our investigation is ongoing. Our team has continued to evaluate new patients. However, I will focus on this initial group of patients. The symptoms which were significantly more common among persons with exposure to affected waterways as compared with controls, including difficulties with memory, headaches, skin lesions, and an unusual complaint of burning of skin on contact with affected water. For the physicians obtaining the medical histories, the collective impact of reports of acute problems with memory from patient after patient was, was quite striking. Events described by the patients included some who had found themselves driving toward predetermined destinations, unable to recall where they expected to go or what they should do on arrival. They described performing activities such as mailing packages and forgetting they'd done it. Those who needed to remember measurements found, them unable to, found themselves unable to remember numbers. Numbers longer than five digits they, they couldn't handle anymore. Others noted that they forgot to bring routine equipment out on the boats. They'd forget to bring water on their boat. They said, I can't believe I did that. I, I never used to do that sort of thing. Um, again, the, clearly the patients were aware that there was something going on. These events were basically incomprehensible to those who had never been confronted with these types of experiences. On physical and laboratory examination of these patients, we really found nothing. However, when we did formal neuropsychological screening, what we found was that exposed persons had clearly demonstrable deficits in learning and memory. Um, as showed in the material which was attached to my testimony, we found that 75% of persons with a high level of exposure to affected waterways had impairments which were severe enough to place them below the second percentile among age and educationally stratified population norms i.e., they were in the bottom 2% of the U.S. population in their ability to learn and remember. In contrast, no impairments were seen in control watermen who were of comparable age with similar educational backgrounds and occupational exposure, with the exception of exposure to waterways containing affected fish. Again, we were able to show in subsequent work that there was a highly statistically significant association between having this type of impairment and degree of water exposure. Taken together, our data indicate that persons exposed to the Pocomoke River have a distinct clinical syndrome characterized by chronic difficulties with learning and memory. Symptoms are most severe in persons with extensive long-term exposure to affected waters. As with most, th most things in science, these studies raise more questions than they answer. Um, Dr. Burkhalter has done superb work in beginning in identifying fisteria, but there's still an incredible amount we don't know. We don't know what triggers the organism to produce toxin. We don't know whether the same toxins cause problems in humans and animals. We don't know how the toxins work on the brain. Again, we have animal models now that clearly suggest that these toxins do have brain effects, um, but we don't know what it does to humans or how it works. Uh, Dr. Morris, I'm going to have to go and vote because we have about five more minutes, okay. and then if you need to con conclude, we'll just have Mr. Pappas uh, conclude with you. I mean, begin with you. We're at recess. Okay. You should stay close by. Okay. <laughs>
Dr. Morris, um, we don't have the mics on, but we're going to start anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, I call this uh, hearing back to order, and do, would you have any concluding comments? Let me, uh, let me have one minute to conclude here. Sure. And uh, I, I think uh, the main thing is I, I wanted to point out, as, it will, as is obvious from all the discussions today, um, Fisteria is a, is a dangerous new emerging pathogen. Um, its appearance raises issues which cover a wide range of disciplines from ecology, marine biology. Would you just suspend a second? Uh, is the transcriber, are we okay or do you need us to wait a second? <laughs> she's, she's frantically hey, I, climbing I'm not underneath hearing an the answer. Uh, <laughs> no, take your time. This is, 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 is your equipment working? Okay, you take your time here. <laughs> this is, uh, we want all this on the record. This is very important testimony. We may be in and out, but we take this, this testimony very seriously. You take your time. We're, we're at recess right now. We're not, we're not in session. Well, I, I've been there. I, I, I just give all my stories to you. Well, we think the backup is working, so everything's being recorded and not... Well, let me just do this, then. Uh, if you have to change the tape, you just let me know. Okay. Okay. Um, this hearing will come to order. Uh, Dr. Morris, you uh, said you I had about a minute to conclude. I had about a minute to okay. conclude. Uh, I, I, what I wanted to point out is that Fisteria is a, is a new emerging pathogen. Its appearance raises a number of issues which cross a number of disciplines from ecology, marine biology, toxicology, epidemiology, neurosciences. Uh, I think many of us have thought of emerging pathogens as something that uh, just related to infectious diseases and something that CDC did. And um, I think what I would uh, emphasize is that uh, hysteria shows that, that a lot of these boundaries are artificial, that uh, Mother Nature doesn't always respect the clear lines we try to draw, draw between disciplines and between agencies. As we try to unravel a story of this microorganism, we will need support and funding from, from NIH, CDC, EPA, Department of Agriculture, a variety of other government sources. And I, I would encourage this committee to make certain that the necessary multidisciplinary expertise and support is available as we begin to search for answers to the questions raised by Fisteria. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Morris. <coughs> Dr. Bruton. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, holding this hearing. It's very important, very important for North Carolina. It's very important for the nation. Our waters eventually all run together, and only together uh, can we solve this problem. Governor Hunt would have um, been here today. Uh, he's out of the country on a trade mission, and he sends his uh, regrets for not being able to uh, be here. Uh, I, Doc, I just need to spend a second. I just need to be assured that we're getting this down on one tape. If we're not, I don't want to proceed. Are we getting this down on one tape? I'm sorry. No, we, we keep a full transcript, and, and this being an investigative committee, we really um, uh, draw on that testimony. I appreciate your care. Okay, well, That's we're good. just going to wait. So we're at, uh, again, a temporary recess.
I tried my best. <laughs> Official, but if C-SPAN is covering this, uh, we can pick it up that way until you're certain. Uh, I mean, that may be a roundabout way, but uh, we can improvise, can't we? Um, so I think we're going to do that. You may have to resort to C-SPAN a bit here, but uh, it does a great job. So with that in mind, um, I am going to call this hearing back to order. I wouldn't, I'd prefer less frantic motion on the left there than when we're doing it. So if, you try, if you're able to get it, fine. If you're not... And uh, I'd like new equipment to come in if we need it. And uh, we will uh, know that we have to uh, uh, turn to C-SPAN to transcribe this, and uh, we'll get approval from all parties on both sides of the aisle to have that done. So uh, Dr. Morris, your comments were recorded. Uh, we'll go there. Uh, they were helpful. <laughs> and uh, do you want to say them for the third time, or are you all set? <laughs> I'll pass. OK. <laughs> Dr. Burton, I'm, Bruton, I'm going to have you start over again. Uh, it At is the beginning. Yeah, at the beginning. It's an important hearing. You said that, and I thank you for that. And uh, it's great to have you here. And you're wearing one of the first ties I ever wore from Save the Children. It's a great tie. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Shays, for this hearing. I think this hearing is important. This hearing is important not only for North Carolina, but for the nation. Our waters eventually all run together. And it's only together can we solve this problem. Governor Hunt is out of the country. He's on a trade mission. He sends his regrets for not being able to uh, be here with you today. As, uh, as an addicted uh, C-SPAN uh, middle-of-the-night watcher, uh, Congressman Shays, I want to use one of you folks' phrases. I want to associate myself with your opening remarks. They were eloquent and don't need to be uh, uh, reset. Uh, Thank you. And I'm certain the governor, uh, given uh, the importance of this hearing, the number of uh, cameras and reporters here would have been here in person had it been possible. I'm joined here today by Wayne McDivitt, Secretary of uh, the North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources. The fact that we are both here, I think, illustrates the complexity of this issue. It is clearly an environmental issue and clearly uh, a health, a public health issue. I like the analogy that has been used here several times today of the dead canary in the mine shaft. We need to wake up. North Carolina has taken several major steps to improve water quality protection. In 1966, the General Assembly created the Clean Water Management Trust Fund, which guarantees a continuing source of revenue for clean water projects during its first year, the fund provided $50 million to help clean up our state's waters. In its uh, recently concluded session, the legislature approved the Clean Water Ro Responsibility Act, putting a two-year moratorium on large hog farms, reducing nutrient limits and wastewater discharges, and improving land use land use management. We're here today to discuss the federal and state agencies' role in dealing with this tiny, troubling organism. It is through a cooperative federal and state partnership that much of the early work on Fisteria was done. Several of Dr. Burkholder's early publications were funded by the Albemarle Pamlico Estuarine Study, or APES. APES was a joint project of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the North Carolina Department of Environment, Health, and Natural Resources. North Carolina, and indeed America, 
is fortunate to have Dr. Burkholder to help us with this problem. North Carolina State Government has also funded additional hysteria research, including that done by Dr. Ed Levin at Duke University, which has shown a link between the dinoflagellate and impaired memory and learning in rats. In the last few years, we in North Carolina have made several attempts to show a clear link between exposure to fisteria in the natural setting and human health problems. In 1995, one of our large fish kills, millions of fish died in a sustained five-week fisteria kill on the lower Noose River. State public health epidemiologists sought out 69 people who were exposed to the kill and interviewed them. 32 met a protocol definition of exposure and completed a full questionnaire. Further medical evaluations were recommended on five people with persistent cognitive complaints, and three of them completed a battery of neurologic and neuropsychiatric tests. The test results were inconclusive. In 1996, we funded a comparison study by the East Carolina University researchers of crabbers in fisteria-plagued waters versus those who worked in waters uh, that were not as high level of fisteria count. That study is not yet complete, but an interim report found no health differences between the two sets no health differences between the two sets of crabbers although it did find a high rate of dermatologic problems among all of the crabbers when compared to non-watermen in a control group. Maryland's recent announcement that it has found a link between fisteria exposure and human health led us to explore the situation again. We've installed a toll-free hotline seeking people who may have been exposed and who are suffering from health problems. Using the Maryland questionnaire, we have identified a group of residents for further study. We have asked the medical schools at UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, East Carolina University to put together a team of doctors to examine this group of people. Dr. Lynn Gratton, who conducted Maryland's neurocognitive uh, studies, will assist us Dr. Glenn Morris will join Dr. Roper's panel by uh, uh, teleconference. In the we have uh, convened a panel of medical researchers and practitioners to help us assess the overall risk to our citizens and advise us on risk management. Former CDC director Dr. Bill Roper, who is the new dean of the UNC Medical School, has agreed to chair this uh, group. We are working cooperatively with others outside of North Carolina. Once it became apparent that Fisteria was more than just a North Carolina concern, we asked the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to convene a regional meeting. That conference is set for later this month. Later this fall, we will host a scientific workshop on Fisteria, bringing together leading researchers to review all the studies that North Carolina has funded and provide us with a qualitative analysis and recommendations for future research. Fisteria was first identified in North Carolina. We intend to be a major player in solving this problem. We'll work together with our federal and regional partners. But we gotta look at the bigger issue. Just determining the risk for human health is not enough. Just managing that risk is not enough. If we're going to whip this problem, then we must clean up the water. Thank you, Mr. Br Dr. Bruton. Let me say uh, to some in the audience who may be um, preparing for the next year, and we're going to delay that till 2. Uh, we think we're going to have some votes, and I just don't want our next uh, hearing panel to come at one and have to wait. I hope and I think we can start at two, but we won't start sooner. So um, uh, the, the, the next hearing, rather, not the next panel, the next hearing will begin uh, around two o'clock. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. McDevitt.
Uh, did you have testimony that you, you you're, you're, uh, you're here to answer questions? I'm here to answer questions. Thank you very much. Let me much. just say I appreciate uh, uh, this, uh, your hearing and your diligence and look forward to the partnership. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I, I, I should have noted, the record did note that you were accompanying Mr. Bru Dr. Bruton, and I thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Gordon. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to address you. I'm Randy Gordon, Commissioner of Health for Virginia. Governor George Allen has asked me to speak on his behalf about Virginia's response to hysteria because his preeminent concern is protection of public's health. That all of you have found yourselves trying to make policy decisions that affect many lives and livelihoods without the support of a solid knowledge base to do so. In trying to be faithful to my responsibility for protecting the public's health, I have found the hysteria issue to be extremely challenging because we're working in a near void of science when it comes to hysteria in human health. You also know well the relief one feels when science finally is able to provide guidance and dispel fears. At this time, we know very little about the association between hysteria toxins and its effects, if any, on human health. The first reports of possible health effects came from North Carolina, where a wide variety of conditions were described among laboratory workers doing research on hysteria. <coughs> Watermen exposed to rivers in North Carolina where hundreds of thousands of fish died, apparently from hysteria, also reported an assortment of symptoms. It has not been scientifically proven which of that multitude of symptoms might be related to hysteria. In fact, a study in North Carolina that compared watermen who worked in waters known to harbor hysteria, those who worked in waters without hysteria, and non-fishing members of the same community showed only that watermen in both groups have more skin lesions than other members of the community. Thanks to Dr. Morris and his colleagues, we now have an investigation of potential health effects in 27 persons exposed to the Pocomoke River. His study is reassuring in that most all of the laboratory and physical tests done on 13 of these persons did not reveal any problems. Of concern, however, is the finding of a distinctly abnormal test in 11 of those exposed. This was defined by testing for 13 different neuropsychological parameters. His study moves us forward to a hypothesis that can be tested. As stated in the conclusion of his in interim report, we feel that it is reasonable and prudent to hypothesize a link between hysteria toxins and health effects. We have, however, a long way to go in proving or disproving this hypothesis. If after further investigations in other settings with appropriate controls, it is ultimately proven, then many more questions about the toxin in human health will need to be answered. How does the toxin enter the body? How can the toxin be easily and quickly identified in exposed individuals? Is there more than one kind of toxin? What levels of exposure to the toxin can cause harmful effects? How long does one have to be exposed to the toxin to develop symptoms? Are these effects permanent or short-lived? How prevalent is the toxin in our water? Is there treatment to reverse the effects of the toxin? Is this a new phenomenon? Or are the effects of this toxin gone heretofore unappreciated? And ultimately, how can we best eliminate or minimize the effect of the toxin on humans? In fact, the scientists and dedicated members of our Virginia Fisteria Task Force remain encouraged that Fisteria may not be harmful to human health through normal recreational or occupational exposure. We have reason to hold this hope because we have not had any recent or historical cases in Virginia similar to those in Maryland, even though we have had lesions in fish similar to those by, caused by Fisteria in the Rappahannock River for 14 years. And we know that Fisteria is not new to any of the waters of the estuaries of the southeast. Since the organism is ubiquitous, the history of unexplained estuary-related illnesses is against this being a widespread health problem. Although the possible link between nutrient levels and occurrence of blooms of hysteria requires confirmation, the fact that Virginia's rivers are becoming cleaner and nutrient levels lower than in the past argues against an emerging and expanding health threat. North Carolina, where billions of fish have died because of hysteria during the past decade, has not been able to detect any human health effects. There could be something different and unique about the Pocomoke River or that part of Maryland unrelated to hysteria toxin that has led to the recent observations. Regardless of what we all hope, we now have a finding that concerns us and needs to be investigated further. We cannot afford to gamble with the public's health. We are committing to join with our neighbor states and federal government to try to get to the bottom of this issue as quickly as possible. Governor Allen has authorized $600,000 to establish a hysteria research unit within the Virginia Department of Health that will work with our universities to conduct studies on hysteria and its toxin. He has authorized an additional 200,000 to improve our laboratory capacities to deal with hysteria and will ask the General Assembly for an additional 1.5 million over the next two years. Finally, he has assembled a group of physicians and psychologists to provide medical consultation and review our health investigations. 
The Federal Government can be helpful to us in a number of ways. By conducting and funding basic scientific research on Fisteria, its environmental significance and its potential for harming the public's health. Coordinating the sharing of data and information between states and federal agencies to expand and accelerate the development of our knowledge base. Expediting the development of scientific probes for the organism and its toxins so that their presence or absence can be rapidly determined. Providing leadership guidance and direction as public health policy is developed in response to the presence of Fisteria. Bringing health officials together to develop consensus on a uniform case definition of the hypothesized health syndrome related to Fisteria toxin. Coordinating interstate epidemiological studies on Fisteria to avoid duplication of effort and pool resources and findings to best take advantage of the knowledge that can be learned from a relatively small number of cases to date. In conclusion, I and Governor Allen very much appreciate your interest in this issue. He has committed the best scientists in Virginia as well as Virginia tax to protect the public's health from this possible threat and he signed along with Governors Carper, Glendinning and Underwood the agreement of regional cooperation on the threat of fisteria-like organisms, coordination of efforts and sharing of information. We are already working with federal agencies to understand this potential public health threat as quickly as po possible. Ultimately, we hope that fisteria toxin turns out not to be a threat to human health under normal circumstances. The best way to protect everyone from this potential threat is by, first and foremost, commitment to the best science, secondly, full cooperation with each other, and thirdly, by communicating openly and honestly with the public about what we know and what we don't know forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Uh, Mr. Barker, we're going to try to get uh, hear your testimony and then I'll vote. So okay. Thank you. you very much. It is hard to take seriously, though, someone you grew up with. I know, and I want to thank you for overcoming that childhood trauma and including <laughs> me here. I also recognize it's a unique um, position I'm in here. Most journalists don't get the opportunity to testify before Congress and I appreciate uh, the respect you're accorded me on that. And I take that responsibility seriously. I want to thank the committee, too. This is an issue that crosses environmental, science, political, health lines, and um, it has achieved um, critical mass in large part because of congressional interest. Um, I had wanted to thank uh, Governor Glenn who um, he makes the minor canary analogy. Um, when it comes to the environment, we do rely on other species to be our early warning systems. But that system only works if we're paying attention. And a case can be made that um, we've been li lagging in that response um, uh, not until the lines have been crossed clearly um, to humans being affected too. Um, my name is Rod Barker. Um, I am the author of a nonfiction book entitled And the Waters Turned to Blood. It was published by Simon & Schuster about six months ago. It chronicles discovery of Fisteria piscicida by Dr. Joanne Burkholder, and also traces her frustrations with the health and democracies in North Carolina to look seriously at the causes and effects of uh, Fisteria. As well, it includes my own investigation into the human health effects, which I believe at that time were poorly collected and inadequately analyzed. To hear that Maryland officials now have found and documented clinical metal effects is a certain vindication, um, but it's also something that I'm not totally satisfied with because what distresses me is, is that um, it was a popular book and not public health system, uh, federal or state agencies, which really alerted the public to this. Um, I've been told for a lot that a lot of people that my book became the sort of primary source of information on this early on. Um, I'd like to say here now, you um, initiated these hearings saying you wanted candor, and I'd like to speak candidly. This book should never have been written. Um, and if the agencies and individuals in charge of protecting public health, of investigating the fish kills in North Carolina, had been on top of this matter, it would not have been written. Um, I don't want to dwell on what went wrong, where the breakdown was, but I'd merely point out that we have 20,000 fish in Maryland waters who are turning up sick. They send a team out. They document health effects. As we heard earlier, we had a billion fish in North Carolina, and they were unable to turn, determine those effects. Were they looking? Were they looking the right way? When you say a billion fish, a billion dead fish yeah. or a billion affected yeah. fish? a billion dead fish, as I understand. Um, but I don't want to point fingers here. Uh, somebody I interviewed in the course of this book uh, told me when it comes to assigning blame, every time you point the finger in one direction, you've got four fingers going in other directions, too, at least one back to yourself. Um, there's complicity enough all around here. Um, and there's also an opportunity for insight. 
And I think it begins with the fact that we all are recognizing here that a new era has dawned um, for public health. And it's an era that is characterized by new species, infectious t organisms that are uh, emerging as a result of a change in environmental conditions. It is an era that is challenging our public health responses. I mean, disease patterns are going to be different. Um, these toxins may not tag their uh, victims in easily identifiable ways. We need to realize that. It's also an era which I think the greatest question that we're going to have to face is that when you have an environmental situation that potentially impacts public health, what is the prudent public health response given unknown risk factors and the fact that science is uncertain? Um, we're going to have to live the rest of the century and the next century with un uncertain science. Um, I'm not going to review the highlights of the, my, my written testimony. That's submitted. What I'd like to do is speak to one thing that was on the front page of the Washington Post today, and I think is on a lot of people's mind. That has to do with the seafood. And I think that if I can characterize this situation, it is the problem writ large. Um, we have an economic, a major economic impact happening in the Chesapeake area because of Fisteria Scare. Local seafood industry is talking about business dropping, laying people off, millions of dollars it's costing. Not because that they have been able to document there being health effects um, as a result of the fish that are being marketed commercially, but simply because people are afraid. Now, to some extent, that fear is irrational. If you understand how Fisteria works, you understand where it's been active, you probably realize that most of those commercial fish that are being marketed are safe. Certainly the ocean fish are safe. But we hear you know, marketing campaigns to sort of restore uh, consumer confidence. The problem here is, is that when that toxin, when that organism was first identified back in 1991 in the estuaries, when it was explained that it this killed fish, there should have been studies initiated right then by the seafood industry, by the state, and by the federal government to determine whether those fish that were affected, you know, passed that toxin up the seafood chain, or other fish who happen to be swimming through that area might be exposed to that toxin and take it into their flesh. Now, those studies have not been completed. And yet we've been giving reassurances to the public that the, the food is safe to eat. You know, if those studies had been conducted, we could have meaningful assurances. Um, I think the issue here now comes to the public's trust in, in the agencies that are out there to protect them. Um, and they have not been on top of this job. Um, they're late in responding. And it's great to hear all the things that have been said here today. Um, it's a little late. Um, uh, let me just say, however, um, that bad examples can be as instructive as a good examples. And um, there is an opportunity here. Um, challenges present opportunities. And if we can see the appearance of fisteria in our coastal waters, now as, you know, as something which generates a whole new kind of state and federal response, it becomes the model for future responses to these kinds of threats. Because there are going to be more of these kind of toxic organisms um, emerging here than fisteria that is known as the cell from hell you know, can become the poster child for this. Thank you very much. I thank you very much. Um, we're, I think, uh, only having one vote. I hope so. Mr. Pappas, I think this time we'll come back. He wasn't sure if we were having a second vote. Uh, this is a, a, a tremendously interesting panel, and we really do need uh, interaction and dialogue if we're going to make a contribution to uh, this issue. So we'll look forward to coming back and uh, asking you all questions. We're at recess. Please uh, take a seat. I think we'll reconvene.
Yeah. The uh, chairman has asked that I reconvene as soon as possible because we do have another group waiting in the wings. Um, and I appreciate everyone uh, being as patient as they have been with us uh, today. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Burkholder, I know you were in my part of the world uh, earlier this week. I'm from New Jersey, but I know you were in Philadelphia just a few days ago, at least. It was reported in a Philadelphia newspaper that you were. I assume that was accurate. <laughs> and uh, you spoke. Uh, about um, how unlikely, I'm paraphrasing your statements that were in the newspaper, it's unlikely that um, Fisteria could uh, find itself up to the Delaware River or the Jersey Shore or points north of there. Uh, was that accurate? And uh, if you could expand upon that, and, and what conditions need to exist, and, and, and I apologize, you may have mentioned this in your statement, I was over there for a vote, but what conditions uh, would need to change the Delaware River area, the Jersey Shore and points north that could cause this uh, uh, problem to occur there? Fisteria, like species, tend to occur in calm, quiet, poorly flushed areas that are brackish with some saltwater influence. And then there needs to be another ingredient, uh, appropriate temperatures, and then a final ingredient of a lot of menhaden uh, and other fish that can trigger it in those areas at the appropriate times. In the Philadelphia area and um, other regions in that vicinity, I have not found any Feasteria, that, and um, I've not heard of any incidents that could be related to Feasteria. The only place that I have found Feasteria-like species so far in that general region have been the Indian River Bay and Delaware and they were associated not with a fish kill or fish disease uh, site but with a fish kill site. So there were no fish dying at the time. In other words, we found a population of non-toxic Feasteria-like species there that were probably just out making a living eating bacteria, algae and so forth. It, I think the, the most important uh, ingredients for Feasteria include the poor flushing rate in particular, and then on top of the poor flushing, appropriate other environmental conditions. The only one that we seem to be able to do too much about on top of all those is nutrient over enrichment, and we have found a lot of uh, Feasteria in nutrient degraded sites. So in your region, I think flow helps to restrict the problem or, or uh, reduce and, and even eliminate um, part of the problem that could occur. I also think that um, at least the species we've worked with so far are a little more warm adapted. It's not to say that you might not find some eventually there that are more cold adapted, but so far we have not. Would anyone else care to comment on that? Um, the issue of temperature, uh, Joanna, perhaps address that? Um, we. We know that Feasteria piscicida is um, optimal range for being lethal to fish is at about 70 or 80 degrees um, and higher. That's pretty warm. Um, that, that's the species we know best from North Carolina's waters. Up in the uh, Pocomoke region, the temperature optimum that we've tested seems to be a little bit lower, uh, more in the range of 70 degrees or a little bit less. You may find other adaptations moving further north if these species come to light. but the species I've worked most closely with have been warm temperate and even uh, more toward Florida subtropical in their district. If there are uh, instances, and there have been uh, in the mid-Atlantic states or towards, uh, again, New Jersey, New York, where there's extended periods <coughs> of what we would even consider very warm weather, 110 degrees, and there have been summers for two, three week period of time where we've had that kind of uh, temperature. Um, which in turn does increase the temperature of the ocean um, along the shore and rivers. Is that a long enough period of time t for the, in a sense, the conditions to have been changed to, to see uh, something such as this occur there? It's possible with all the other conditions that I have mentioned also coinciding. So the probabilities are not as great as further south, at least for the species I'm familiar with, although it's possible. 
Another uh, question, um, again, referring to the same uh, newspaper article, was uh, indicated that there were only approximately 28 individuals who in some way have been affected by this. <coughs> uh, I don't know if that's a, a correct number. And if, if it's so, if any of the panelists could indicate uh, where these folks are from and if uh, if there seems to be one age category that seems to be more uh, affected than, than another. I think probably at this point in terms of evaluation of patients, we, we have the most substantive database. We have examined a total of 35 individuals with fairly comprehensive exams, including neurocognitive exams. Excuse um, me? We've examined a total of 35 individuals. Now, that includes 10 control individuals who we specifically selected because um, they were people who had not had exposure uh, or where we, where we thought that their chance of having had exposure to Fisteria would have been minimal. Um, so we're talking 25 individuals who had complaints. Of those, using a very conservative case definition and also excluding anyone who might have any other possible symptoms uh, or possible reason for the symptoms which we observed. Um, we came down with 11 people who appeared to clearly have health effects, substantive health effects associated with um, the exposure to rivers where these fish with fish with lesions are. I would say that in many ways our data are reassuring in that what we found was a highly statistically significant association between degree of exposure and um, the probability of, of being, uh, of, of having significant uh, findings um, so that the people at highest risk were the people who had long-term daily chronic contact with the water over a period of months. When we got into other groups, uh, other individuals, for example, people who might simply be going across the river on boats, um, even though they might do it on a regular basis. Uh, we found no evidence that they had this symptom complex. So again, the symptom complex appears to be associated primarily with chronic, long-term, extensive exposure to water which contains uh, fish which have these lesions. Now, the thing about something like this, of course, is there are questions about case finding. How many cases are there out there? I don't know. Um, and this is one of the things that's needed is to begin to look comprehensively, not only in Maryland but at other states, um, to look at high-risk groups, which in Maryland appears to be the, the watermen's groups who have very extensive contact with water, to begin to see if we can identify milder clinical syndromes. Again, we've used a very, uh, very conservative definition for our, our definition of cases in Maryland. Uh, we, we are essentially at the start of a long journey. You know, there's, there's a lot that we have to learn about the organism the toxins about the human health effects before we, we really can know what the overall impact of, of this organism is in terms of human health. Mr. Pappas? Yes, sure. Let me add to that. Uh, I'd like to add, in, in Virginia, we have had no confirmed uh, cases of folks with this syndrome, even though Describe we've had our Describe hotline uh, open, and as soon as we had the concerns in Pocomoke, we sent notice out to the local media and provide a hotline on the Eastern Shore for folks to call. And in talking with Dr. Morris, he says that the findings are rather striking in the individuals affected, which um, is, is somewhat reassuring in terms of the case finding in, in that if they are, as he said, very striking, we would hope that, that we would be able to identify cases if there are any in Virginia through our hotline, that sort of thing. And, and it is reassuring that we that we have not had any human cases with this confirmed syndrome as of yet, um, which also I'd like to remind the subcommittee that, that uh, Dr. Morris's study looks at as the exposure, not exposure to the toxin or necessarily even to the organism because that's difficult to establish, but it's exposure to the Pocomoke River, which you know adds to our need to be able to identify the toxin or the toxic form of the organism in a fairly expeditious fashion so that we can establish these human health effects if there are any. Yeah, one comment I'd like to make is I, I think we have to remember with this organism and organisms like it, um, I mean, they do not often accommodate those conventional techniques of investigation. And if we continue to look for striking responses, um, we might be missing 
the more subtle, chronic, insidious effects. Thank you. Um, one question, like all of the panelists, or as many as would choose to respond, um, what uh, role do you think the federal government or any of its agencies uh, could have, should have, uh, regarding uh, you know, public education uh, or um, um, dealing with uh, what may be just a very localized uh, problem? From my vantage point, I, uh, again, at a university, um, you know, I think what we have are some answers, but a tremendous number of questions. Um, and there clearly is a need for support of basic research to begin to try to answer those questions. I think that's one recurring theme which has shown up throughout the, uh, the discussions today, is the need for additional research. And again, this goes beyond just simply um, public health surveillance types activities but we really need to get some, some basic science, basic answers, both about the human sex, but also about the organism. There's clearly a need for you know, top quality basic science research focused on this organism. And that would, in, that would include, as, as needed, funding for National, uh, National Science Foundation, NIH, and other agencies have the capability of funding at a, at a very basic science level. Sure, doctor. Just, just to add to that, I think the federal government ought to have a, a very large role in coordinating and helping to bring together this uh, kind of effort. Uh, I would hope that they would establish uh, protocols, for instance, that would allow us to uh, add the experiences of the various areas together. Uh, Dr. Morris, for instance, has some very dramatic dose-related uh, information. It's on a few cases. It's probably true. Mm -hmm. But if we could uh, expand the number in a way that you could really compare them, mm -hmm. it'd be very yeah, useful. So getting together and yeah. uh, developing uh, clear uh, protocols and ways that we're going to cooperate and trying to understand this problem ought to be enormously useful. I was uh, just add to uh, what Dr. Bruton said that we uh, heard from many uh, today that the uh, uh, that the hysteria is in different ways. We've said that hysteria is a symptom of a greater problem, and uh, uh, in North Carolina, we uh, uh, we know and understand and recognize that the nutrient load is uh, is too high in, in our waters, and uh, we we feel like that we've. Uh, we know that we've made significant uh, gains in recent years in terms of the, the kinds of things that Dr. Bruton uh, uh, talked about in his uh, testimony. The Clean Water Management Trust Fund, the Clean Water Responsibility Act, and uh, fisheries reform, and, and other things. Uh, we, we are excited about this partnership, uh, both with the other states and, and with, the, uh, with the federal government. I, I would just add to, uh, to what he said, uh, to what these uh, folks have said. We need significant research in this area, significant dollars. Uh, in research, the states, the different states have talked about the monies they've put into uh, research. Uh, EPA has helped us with several of our own studies, the Albemarle uh, Pamlico uh, Sound uh, uh, Estuary Study. Uh, that has allowed us to put some uh, research money in there and do some of the basin-wide approaches that we should do. In addition to research, I would say that uh, any support, we have about a, I'm going to say a $12 billion dollar uh, uh, sewer wastewater uh, treatment uh, needs in the state of North Carolina. Uh, any improvements and, and uh, any research or support for improvements and in innovative uh, uh, technology for the uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the same uh, improved technology for uh, uh, point uh, source dischargers. And I would say uh, research and, and improvement and in innovative uh, for our animal uh, technology for our waste uh, facilities. Uh, and then finally, to uh, just strengthen the tools for addressing all the non-point source uh, pollution. Uh, the uh, Clean Water Act and, and uh, uh, is a good uh, place in the reauthorization of that is a place to address that. I was senior advisor to the governor in, uh, in, uh, uh, for a period of time, several years, and uh, I was senior advisor when FEMA uh, hit our state of North Carolina. And uh, to just give uh, an anecdotal uh, 
uh, illustration to what Dr. Bruton was saying. We the point of entry uh, at the federal government. All of the resources that were coming together to help us in that uh, time of crisis and the congressional delegation and all the staffs pulling together at a, uh, really about a year ago, uh, right at the end of a session and, and, and uh, uh, so the point of entry. FEMA was a point of entry. And I would say that, uh, uh, that, that in that emergency, we all knew that point of entry. Perhaps that coordinative, collaborative effort to better understand how to pull all the team together uh, could certainly, as we address a, a regional uh, and national uh, uh, problem, is a, is a place and a role for the federal government. Thank you. I uh, have one last question, um, and then we're going to have to break, or I'm going to have to break. Uh, I think we'll probably recess until 1.50. There's a series of votes, uh, five series of votes. Uh, should be able to reconvene then for the last group. But the la my last question is, are there any dangers to the public f uh, that may consume seafood? I think that's probably one of the most uh, asked questions about this. And, and if maybe a couple of you could respond, or at least one of you could respond, and then we'll conclude. Based on the research that we've done to date, we really cannot say whether seafood is being affected in Feasteria toxic outbreak areas, but there is some encouraging information to suggest that at least um, healthy fish in those areas that don't look uh, problematic in terms of erratic behavior, open sores, uh, or, or um, skin peeling and so forth, fish that look normal and healthy may be all right for consumption. I would hate, however, to put the public at risk, which is one reason why I'm, I'm very admiring of Maryland's efforts in closing off the areas of Chesapeake Bay to any seafood consumption, which are known to have toxic feasteria outbreaks. I would like to mention some of the wildlife effects that we've seen. Gulls have swooped down and have been picked so fast as they're dying that, that it's difficult to count them. So it looks as though wildlife are not suffering any ill health effects from these organisms. Um, based on all of our research, it seems that the toxins from the are so lethal and so, um, uh, problematic to fish that fish are extremely sensitive to them. It doesn't take very much what we gather of these toxins to kill or to make bleeding sore fish because of its behavior. So a little bit of this toxin usually ends up in making fish pretty bad. One can tell problem. We folks to avoid fish that look like that and be on the safe side, not from areas that are affected by fish. But we're hoping with research uh, we're, we're working very hard to do, we'll be able to give better diagnosis in the form of the pure toxins. Once we know the chemical identity of the toxins, then we can go into fish tissues and determine where it's harbored, if it is, what the breakdown products are, more or less toxic. Really nail that question. For now, we're erring on the side of caution, but it looks like that, that things will be okay. Just uh, if we could just Very do it in a minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 30 second comment. I, I can say, at least in terms of the logic studies we've done, um, the data suggest the critical thing is, is exposure in terms of respiratory skin exposure. We do not have evidence to date that there is any, anything related to, to consumption. Again, um, still small, but at least at this point it clearly appears that it's the respiratory and skin routes that are the primary ways of, of uh, acquiring or primary risks for, for acquiring the effects we've seen. Uh, one point I'd make, as I said earlier, we, there is no test in fish. Um, we don't even have the toxin characterized, don't know all the effects short term. That said, however, I, I think the public needs to realize we're going to have a public health do in Maryland where they are going to act erring on the side of caution, protecting public health and closing rivers. Um, that that should bring about a certain amount of confidence in public officials. So if those officials then in turn come back and say, well, you know, we took this step to protect your health, and now we're taking a step in saying to you that food is safe to eat. I think we have to extend that same trust to them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before <coughs> we recess for about 45 minutes, I'd just like to consent that uh, my statement, which I was unable to make earlier, be included in the record. Without objection. 
Uh, we will uh, remain in recess until about uh, uh, 10 minutes to uh, 2 o'clock. Thank you. And if, yes, if this panel please would uh, return at that time, we'd appreciate it. This panel. Yeah. More questions? More questions, I guess. Yeah. here and will come to order. Uh, in my 10 years, I've never had an experience like today. And uh, so I can at least tell you from my standpoint, this is uh, certainly not typical. And what's a little frustrating is that, uh, as um, Mr. Barker pointed out, this is a very serious issue. And um, uh, we need to have an open and honest dialogue about this issue uh, for a lot of reasons. I do want to say that. Um, it seems to me that North Carolina experienced this first and um, maybe didn't have it as well as it should have, uh, but it was the first experience. Uh, I would think a uh, state like uh, Maryland has learned from the uh, failures that have existed earlier and um, responded to them. I don't want to dwell too much on the past, but I do think it needs to be a matter of public record. And then I'd like to take what we've learned from the past and, and move forward. And so, um, Dr. Buckholder, I'd like you to, I'd like you to kind of run through, not micro detail, but run through uh, the process that you ran through as a scientist and um, describing uh, why, one, we know you encountered difficulties getting your story out, and as Mr. Barker points out, uh, uh, written about your experiences that wouldn't have been written had you not encountered that. But uh, I'm not interested in names. I'm, interested, I'm just interested in the evidence from, from your, your first moment when you thought there was a big problem. When that and then just through uh, how, how it evolved. In May of 1991, we first tracked Feasteria to a fish kill in Blount's Bay on the Pamlico River estuary. And I gave that information to our state officials, and it seemed to be welcomed with open arms. Um, there had been fish kills in the Pamlico for quite a long time, and there had been no way of determining a cause. It's so we began to track Feasteria and other fish kills. We gave the state folks this information. We finally saw that there was at least and one. In what capacity were you giving this as a, not as a government official, as a researcher, as a scientist? In what capacity? As a researcher who had been working with some of the state biologists down in one of the regional offices quite a lot on the issue and was asked to come in and give a seminar about it and then to provide whatever information I could on fish kills. So mm -hmm. I began to work with, um, with those folks and um, also gave our fish kill records to those folks. Um, whenever we were fish kills we would, that were linked to Feasteria, we would call them in. Also, um, sometimes on weekends, when the state biologists could not go out, we, we would be contacted by some of those folks and asked to go out. Would you cover this fish kill for us? Would you turn in the information? Glad to have it. So fairly detailed um, information sheets for them on the fish kills. In 1993, I released a report that linked Feasteria piscicida to nutrient over-enrichment from in some of our studies. In 93, when in 93? I think that came out in July of 1993. Okay. And it was a report that was jointly funded, as Mr. Bruton mentioned, by uh, the EPA and also DEHNR. It was part of the Albemarle Pamlico Estuary Program or Estuary Study. However, um, it was at that point that I began to confront some fairly serious obstacles to getting the information seriously considered by the agency. I was told by one state official working for the Department of Environmental Management, especially in the water quality section, that I would need 10 years of data before I would be willing to consider that feasibility might kill fish and that anything I said about nutrient over-enrichment was grossly premature. We continue to provide information to state officials we um, tried repeatedly, both, both in seminars, written documentation, providing publications as we received them, and, and um, hand-delivering them on occasion, information about fish kills, fish disease, 
and other problems. What were you trying to convince state officials of? I mean, they knew fish were dying, but that there was a relationship and impact uh, to, to human life. I mean, what were you trying to convince state officials of? At the time, we were simply trying to inform the state of Fisteria's involvement in fish kills. But I learned something rather, rather um, disturbing, which was that none of our information was in fish kill databases. I was told that, that um, it wasn't that I it was. I don't really know what that means. I, I probably should. But when you say none of it was appearing, I mean that in the official fish kill records that came out, Fisteria still very um, you were gathering the data, it, it, it was like it didn't happen even? Yes, and in fact, it was a kill of about a billion fish in 1991. Now, can you slow down a second? When you say a billion fish, um, that's, I mean, it's still a large number for me. And, and I mean, <laughs> a, a millions of fish would be a lot. But you, a, a, you, was there a, a sense that you were literally talking about a billion fish? I mean... The estimates from biologists in the Washington Regional Office in the Division of Environmental Management from the department um, were estimates of about okay. a billion okay. fish so, dying. Okay, so in a billion fish. Yeah. And those fish were uh, mostly menhaden, about 90% of them. They had open bleeding and they had to be bulldozed from the beaches. It covered about a six-week period in September and October of 1991. Uh, about a year later, I was and, going... And how, how big an area? It stretched about a 20 square mile area, is my understanding, mm -hmm. altogether. We didn't treat areas like the biologists did. Um, about a year later, I was looking through the fish kill data sheets and fish kill reports. Data, to my understanding, was just being compiled because North Carolina has a very poor environmental protection spending record that I think our government worked hard in the last few years to try to turn around, but it's been a historic problem. And so we didn't have very many biologists to be able to get to fish kills. And most of the fish kills were attributed to low dissolved oxygen, even when the fish contained open bleeding sores. Mm -hmm. So we tracked large kills like this, as well as other kills. And we reported in the report that was released that DEHNR helped to fund. We also later published that information, and it came to international science publications in 1995. But it never did appear in North Carolina's official fish kill records within that agency. Uh, a friend of mine from Harvard called to get fish kill records recently and found that there was only mention of Fisteria in a couple of um, places in the fish kill database. Mm -hmm. so it's a problem that I have informed Secretary McDevitt about, and he's assured me we'll, we're going to be working to add Fisteria to the fish kill data records. But at the time, before these folks actually appeared on the scene, there seemed to be very high resistance on the part of some of the state officials in the water quality section to acknowledge that Fisteria could even kill fish. Mm -hmm. um, then when we found human health effects linked to Fisteria... When was that? That occurred first with, with um, a situation in which I was hurt in January 1993. And then later that year, although we thought we had been, been moved to facilities that were going to protect our health, it turned out that the facilities were improperly constructed. They were properly designed, but improperly constructed. And my research associate was also hurt. So in late 1993, the research, uh, okay. in, my, in late 1993, when that happened, I began to quietly survey fishermen. And really what I was after, just asked them if they'd ever been hurt out on the water, and then pieced together what they said with areas where I knew fish kills were occurring that were related to Fisteria by their responses. It seemed that they were experiencing some of the, f the effects that were very similar to effects that we had experienced in the laboratory from organisms without having scientific evidence to, to really correlate what the fishermen were seeing in the field with what we had seen in the lab and also because the fishermen had expressed to me that they feared coming forward because of, of effects on the and adverse encounters with the agency. I I felt that there wasn't much I could do um, but respect their confidentiality at that point, although I tried to encourage them to come forward to state health officials. They didn't want to do that. What, and was, the, what was the darkest moment in, in your whole experience? What would be the darkest moment? The moment you felt the most uh, despair and um, when would that be? Any particular moment? There was a series of events that culminated in um, a situation in which I that with very as um, has been related in a recently published book, that 
funding was being deliberately directed away from my laboratory, so it was uh, allowing my students to have to suffer as well. I was being branded, and my research associate was being branded by health officials that that um, Mr. Bruton has now inherited. They weren't working for him. Uh, to the effect that my research associate and I were just extremists who had made up the entire problem. We were ridiculed a great deal by state agency officials. Um, it was widely disseminated by a water quality uh, people in the agency that I had never published and was completely discredited. There were even a lot of personal attacks, personal life as well as professional life. And this all happened in about late 1995. I was low ebb. Um, Dr. Gordon, you're providing a very valuable um, contribution, uh, and because you really uh, present some of a, a, a I want to be really here. Um, these hearings are not unlike hearings we had with the safety on the blood supply and why it took so long to break up to, to the uh, AIDS, the transmission of, of um, certain pathogens in our blood by the fact that our defense system wasn't up, and then when we, when we realized what had happened, we didn't react quickly. I understand that people in the healthcare field have a very difficult task of making sure we're not becoming hysterical about something causing tremendous harm with bad stuff. But um, we had the same problem in, in this committee when we got into the golf syndrome. I mean, you know, when we started, it was like, uh, well, we can't um, the illness of a soldier, so the soldier, in essence, isn't sick when they're sick. May we explain why? Uh, and, and I get the feeling that basically uh, Virginia's at a point where uh, kind of halfway between where North Carolina was and kind of just closed, frankly, in the beginning to Maryland, which is basically willing to go the other way. And I kind of see you right in the middle. And uh, maybe you can sort out the scientist's uh, challenge. Because um, it's a statement that basically you kind of take that middle ground. Explain that middle ground for us. And then I'm going to go to you, Mr. Gilchrist. I'd like to note that we uh, have Mr. Castle, who's not a member of the committee. I believe, Dr. Brookholder, you're going to be going to Delaware uh, in a week or two. He said he wanted to hear what you had to say, and it's not him here. Um, but it, Dr. Gordon. Mr. Chase. Um, it is very difficult because I think the, the science that we have now for um, a number of public policy options and certainly size that in North Carolina are dealing with a different set of circumstances. I think that's uh, important to, to keep in mind. And we're trying to be as true as possible to where we are in this process in terms of um, evidence and association and proof, if you will. And with Dr. Morris's report, his interim report, at least what, what, what I've seen, we're in complete agreement with that. And that is that we're at the hypothesis stage of a link between the stereotoxin and human health effects. And at this point, it's hard to certain which way this could go. Uh, if you remember, we've had other examples of, uh, for example, power lines in the association with leukemia, which was of, was of great concern back in the late uh, 70s when it was initially reported. And, and we've been that for a number of years. And association, the, the evidence for that association is, is weaker and weaker as, as time goes on. And so, you know, at this point, we're trying to make the best policy decisions and balance the, the risks and benefits, if you will, with the various policy options. And, and I think everybody on this panel has, has accurately portrayed the issue is that we, we know what we know is so much less than what we don't know. And that's why I think we're all here suggesting that, that the best thing we can do is to gear up together as states and the federal um, government to try to get some good um, investigations and good science out as quickly as possible uh, so that we can have more of a ground on which to make some of our policy decisions. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, the difference, and I think it's, uh, that's a helpful analogy, the, the difference with leukemia and 
high power transmission lines were ultimately was that we couldn't we couldn't uh, see a, uh, a uh, the statistics ultimately didn't back up the fact that you had a concentration of leukemia next to power lines yes, sir. and there were some areas where you didn't but don't the statistics here point in another direction um, don't I mean we do know we have the fish kills we do know that we're dealing with a, a, a toxin we do know that that um, we have very real symptoms. I mean, those symptoms are real. Um, so uh, I guess the end, and I'm going to ask each of you as public officials, and then I'll, and I, what triggers action? We can't, uh, the bottom line is sometimes you can't wait for the science to catch up with facts um, that hit you square in the face. And so, Dr. Gordon, what, what will, what will, what well, we can't wait at this point, I, I, I can't wait for all this right, research. Right. At this point, I would say that I, the analogy I was trying to draw is sort okay. of where we were back in the late 70s with the transmission line issue, because at that point, we did have a scientific study that did have statistical significance, if you will, um, with childhood leukemia and, and power lines. And at this point, we have, have one uh, study by Dr. Morris that suggests a stati statistical relationship that um, really has not been established, uh, hasn't been peer-reviewed at this point. And my, my point here is that we are just at the beginning stages of forming hypotheses and then testing those um, by scientific method. And, and I agree, we want to get to the bottom as quick of this as quickly as possible. Um, and in terms of what it take, I think we would like to see... Let me, let me just um, interrupt you yeah, a second. Sure. In your testimony, um, quote Dr. Morris, uh, who says, his study removes us forward to a hypo hypothesis that can be tested. As stated in the conclusion of his interim report, quote, we feel that it's reasonable and prudent to hypothesize a link between fisteria toxins and health effects. Now, do you agree with that or not? Yes, sir, I agree. Okay. I agree and if that. you do agree, then what kind of, what does that trigger? That's really what I'm asking. Besides weight. Well, what that triggers is, I think, what, what you've seen today, and that is um, a, an immediate response in terms of looking at this issue and this hypothesis and testing it, response from the, the states working together and the federal agency to, to pour resources into this to try to determine if the hypothesis is true or not. Okay. Um, I, I, I said, I'd, yes. There might be um, one point that I could add to that, and, and, and that relates to something that Dr. Bruton said earlier. There is now in press a peer-reviewed international science publication which demonstrates experimentally, and I think I mentioned this in my testimony as well, that small mammals, rats, exposed to toxins of Fisteria piscicida exhibit uh, long-term serious learning disabilities. So there is additional scientific information from that source Certainly, um, I have a great deal of respect for Dr. Morris's work, he, and, and I have no doubt but that it will be very solid when it gets to the stage. There is another report of laboratory exposures, which was co-authored by a Duke medical specialist, and that also occurs in the peer-reviewed science literature. Okay. I, I, I have lots more questions. This is a terrific panel. Um, I do want to get to Mr. Gilchrist, and, and um, Mr. Allen, who is a member of the committee, is uh, kind of uh, waving his opportunity to speak for a second to let Mr. Gilchrist get involved. But the one thing we can all agree, that any uh, that is not uh, kept, any data that's ignored, that's an outrage. And if there were fish kills, that data should be there. I mean, that's the one thing. So that's very disturbing. That has a whole element. And maybe others would suggest that that didn't happen. But um, Mr. Gilchrist. If, Mr. Allen, if, if, you know, I can, if you didn't want to wave, if, okay. if, no, if we I, go, I don't mind you going before I do. I'm okay. happy to have you go. Um, you, you've been here a long, uh, uh, there's a certain principle here. You were here before no, I got I'm, here, and I'm happy to live by that instead of uh, Not only are we bipartisan, but we're gracious with each other. Welcome. Well, that's a very nice committee. I'm thinking about doing it next year. <laughs> <laughs> I could keep the same seat, though, with, with, with Cindy here next year. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I, I'd like to, um, first of all, I'd like to 
bring Mr. Allen in on, on a, just a, a very quick series of questions be because before you left, you made mention of um, phosphorus as a possible problem as far as a variety of uh, it's whether ag runoff or, or from other sources, maybe from sewage treatment plants and things like that. Um, and when you left, <coughs> it was stated that phosphorus is one of those um, words that if you mention it in a nutrient management plan uh, has a dramatic impact on agriculture. Right now, basically, nitrogen is used by a number of states uh, for nutrient management to protect ag runoff from nitrogen. Uh, and I'm not sure how other states, Maryland has a pretty good program. It's a voluntary program, but they have a pretty good program. The problem with that is that they don't include phosphorus in that. It's been recently discovered, and I'd like to bring Dr. Gordon in on this, uh, in, in a sort of a philosophical and actually everybody on the panel. It's recently been, there's strong evidence now that phosphorus moves. People used to think that phosphorus, uh, if you controlled um, erosion, you controlled phosphorus. There's very strong evidence around the world that phosphorus, uh, you can have soil that exceeds its capacity to absorb any more phosphorus, and then phosphorus will move with surface water with rain. It was brought to my attention that that shouldn't be a serious problem, that for every acre, the maximum that you would lose per year for every acre is about a pound and a half. At any rate, under two pounds would be lost per acre. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, actually. For example, if you consider the Pocomoke watershed, 170,000 acres are farmed in the Pocomoke watershed. So there's an excessive amount of phosphorus in the Pocomoke watershed you could be putting into the Pocomoke River, even though it's a pound and a half or a minimum a pound per acre, 170,000 pounds. 170,000. So that's pretty significant. We've banned phosphorus, I don't know, 20 years ago because we saw the problems. Uh, so there is, and I also think that farming practices can be improved to solve that problem without dramatic economic harm to farmers because there is available technology, and that's my point. There is available technology on a whole range of things. Dr. Gordon, you said earlier in your testimony that the void of science in this area of hysteria. Um, and peer-reviewed science, what is science? It seems to me, though, that there is um, a tremendous amount of information that has been um, developing over the last several years in the area of hysteria. Now, it might be different in the Ram Rappahannock River or some of the rivers in Virginia, but if you compare the similarities between Pocomoke River and the Chickamacomico River or Kings Creek on the eastern shore to what's going on in um, North Carolina, there would be some similarities. And uh, so with all the prevalent information, I think there's some distinction that we can make between a fairly freshwater river and the problems and the problems in some of these uh, brackish estuaries. I'm talking too long. Yeah. I, know. Um, I guess the question I have is to Dr. Morris and Dr. Burkholder, and Dr. Burton, or Bruton, I'm sorry. Let me just say this, since I, uh, any member, any of you that want to jump in, I, I'd like a little lively yeah, this here, so, and, uh, and that includes you, Rod, as well. And anyone who wants to jump in at a point <laughs> to clarify it, even if you weren't directly asked, uh, feel free to let the questioner know you want to and just, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. Could I just ask the question? Because yeah, it well, I just want to clarify the, the, the void of science. Well, yeah, and, and my um, quote was that the void of science when it comes to fisteria and human health, which um, you were talking about some other issues with, with okay. fisteria. So I just want to clear, clarify what my comment actually was. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm noticing that all of us up here practically have our coats off. If anyone wants to, please feel free. Seriously, if you want to take your jackets off, the, there's light and so on. Okay. Well, Dr. Morris, you, you've, you've um, made some evaluations of... Uh, citizens in Maryland, just, I just want to make sure I have this correct, and you've concluded that something probably in this microorganism called Fisteria um, has neurologically impacted P 
people who have been exposed to it. Is that a fair statement? Yes, with, with one slight caveat, um, again, as Dr. Gordon has pointed out, what we, what we have found is that there are very clear, clearly demonstrable, objective neurologic problems, specifically impairments in learning and memory in people with high levels of exposure to the Pocomoke River. Again, 75% of people we've examined who have a high level of exposure, weekly exposure, no, daily exposure over, over a number of weeks to months, are below the second percentile on national norms in terms of their ability to learn and remember. And that's, fairly, that's a, a fairly striking impairment. In contrast, controls are completely normal. Now again, the association is with exposure to the Pocomoke at times when there are fish with active Fisteria-like lesions. As has been pointed out, we can't assay for the toxin. And so consequently, you know, what we have is a, if you will, a circumstantial chain of evidence. We know that there are fish there which have lesions that look like Fisteria. We know that Fisteria are there. We know that Fisteria produces toxins that causes neurologic damage in animals. Um, we know that we have people with neurological impairment who have had high levels of exposure to the water that has fish that have lesions that were caused by, look like they're caused by Fisteria. Um, again, as we stated in our report, we feel it is reasonable and prudent to say that, you know, to put it together as a chain and say that the problem goes back to the Fisteria. Uh, Dr. Bruton, has there been similar medical evaluations in North Carolina, but drawing different conclusions? No. First, I think we have to say something about uh, the nature of trying to understand a problem like this. Um, the chairman's analogy about AIDS and Gulf War syndrome is an apt one <coughs> because the science is shifting. The science is changing. In fact, that's the very essence of science. You, you build on what you have learned with another piece of information. So we make big mistakes when we try to uh, talk about an understanding here with when the base science information was there at the other time. And, and of course, we don't want to do that. We want to put this thing together and move forward so we, under, uh, so we understand it. Yeah. And, and, and I would, would say... You, I, would you, uh, from that statement... Um, actually, I'm not sure. I, un I, I understand yeah. that statement, but it wasn't really what I asked. From that statement that you just made, would, would you say that North Carolina has not done the same kind of medical evaluations that Dr. Morris has been involved in? As I said, no, we have not done that kind of uh, yeah. uh, evaluation. I, I think in fairness to North Carolina, um, we learned an awful lot from North Carolina. Um, we had access to all of the North Carolina data before we started our evaluation. I knew, would, if I could just interrupt yeah. for a second, this is not an indictment of North Carolina. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if this little critter, and I understand there's a lot of little critters like it, um, reacted somewhat different in North Carolina than it reacted in the Pocomoke River in Maryland. We don't know that. There's not any way to know that. And so if it reacted, the medical um, impacts might be slightly different. We don't know that. Dr. Burkhold. Actually, um, the anecdotal information that many fishermen have turned in about this organism and its effects in North Carolina was strikingly similar to what happened in Maryland. The reason I think that Maryland, one of the many, that Maryland was able to make the progress it made was that it did learn from North Carolina. We were able to counsel Maryland and tell them, look for fish lesions that, like, that look like this. Go to these areas to sample. Sample just like this. Look for these kinds of effects and whatever else that you think would be prudent in your fishermen because this is what we've seen in laboratory work and it gives you at least a starting point for evaluation. Maryland took information that had been available for three years and applied it to the Maryland situation. And there were striking analogies, both in the fact that similar Fisteria-like species were present in both areas and in their effects on fish, and apparently now in their effects on humans based on anecdotal reports and also the experiences we had in the lab, and then going back to what Dr. Morris has seen. Yeah. And, and just to, to follow that up, 
we're going to learn from Maryland's experience. We, we are using Maryland's uh, protocol for identifying the uh, right kind of people to study. Dr. Morris in the morning is going to be connected with our North Carolina the folks who did his neurocognitive uh, studies are guiding uh, our studies. I think that's the larger and more important point that uh, we're building uh, together here, our base of information. So we move from anecdote, in this case they're probably true and probably turn into science, but so we can move from anecdote to science. So then it looks like that the hysteria that is in the Pokemon, uh is similar, if not the same, than the, than the hysteria in North Carolina? Oh, you got the world's expert. That's her, not me. <laughs> yes, um, based on toxic bioassays that we have done with both Maryland's species and North Carolina's, we have two species that co-occur in both North Carolina and Maryland. In toxic bioassays, they have affected fish extremely similarly. They have caused open bleeding in exactly the same locations. Um, the fish die in exactly the same way, exhibit the same sorts of symptoms. We are going about the business of determining whether the toxins are identical in both of those species, but it, it certainly is though that's the case and the species are similar. One last quick question, right, Mr. Right. Chairman. And I also, I, Mr. Barker wanted to jump in and I, I don't yeah. know. Oh, you know, yeah, that's, I'll make two real, oh, I'll let you jump in because that reminded me of another okay. question. I appreciate that. I, I think questioning is very astute here. Um, I think a variable that needs to be cleared up is that the different investigative techniques that were used by the three different states um, are not the same. I mean, what Maryland um, did is different than what North Carolina did, and quite frankly, I'm not sure what Virginia is doing. But there seems to be an opportunity here for that kind of communication between the different departments who are investigating it, see what are the protocols, how are they going about it, and learn from Maryland, and see what did Maryland do that they turned up those findings. And I'd like to know if Virginia and if North Carolina do intend to follow Maryland's investigative protocols. I, I'd like to just ask you in a sense, are you saying if you don't look for something, you may not find well, it? Yeah, your yeah, um, different methods of inquiry will give you different results, and that's a variable here. And that's, that's one of the problems, is that people are looking at it in different ways. I have two, two last qu quick questions. I'd just like to know what is this present status of Mrs. Jorgensen and her two children. And uh, just a comment about giant food not selling any more fish from the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I would like to do what the governor's doing. He's going down to Cambridge today to feed his staff rockfish. Uh, but seriously, I'd just like to take some high-profile canoe trip on certain sections of the Pocomoke or the lower eastern shore, catch fish and eat those fish. Is that a prudent thing to do? I, I, I'd like to say a, a couple things about Maryland's response in this. I really sympathize with what you're saying, and I, I, I think it would be a prudent thing to do under these circumstances. Based on all the knowledge we have of these organisms, Maryland has acted on the side of erring on the side of protecting human health. When that government says that as far as every scientific piece of information they have, everything they've amassed, it's safe to eat fish from most of the Chesapeake Bay, I strongly agree with them. And I have told uh, various folks today that citizens in Maryland should not be concerned. And it, we, our seafood in Mar Maryland is safe throughout almost the entirety of Chesapeake Bay everything we know about these organisms except in the very tiny, the very relatively small areas of that bay which have been closed. They haven't been closed as we know for sure that healthy looking seafood from those areas could cause human health problems. They've been closed because we don't want to take a chance. So that seafood would never make it to market. I think it's really a tragedy that Maryland's fishermen are going through this situation. I think it, it, it shows such a pressing need for environmental education of our citizens. And the Chesapeake's had one of the best programs in that in the country, so I guess we just need a lot more. But here you have a state that's acted very proactively, and its fishermen are suffering greatly. That shouldn't be happening. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd just like to um, clarify for the record what, what Virginia has done in trying to uh, elicit of this year related illnesses. When the Pocomoke, when we closed the Pocomoke 
at the same time that, that Maryland did because of fish kill, we established a hotline over on the eastern shore. We, our health department uh, has 35 districts, and at that point we had our district health officials, uh, and you know the eastern shore is a fairly um, close community, and so the employees of the health department actually grow up in that community and, and they know what's going on, they know the watermen and that sort of thing. So they went out and actively talked people with this, um, any, any illness or any rel um, related complaints. We advertise in the newspaper um, as to if you think you have problems, here's a number to call, contact your local physician. We contacted all the local physicians in the area on the Eastern Shore to refer any uh, su suggested or suspected cases to us at the health department established a uh, line in light of the uh, fish with lesions in the Rappahannock and the Great River. And so we are out actively looking for cases. I'd also like to um, pick up on what Mr. Bart where, where, said. Where about do people call? I'm sorry? Where do they come for, uh, with a little Yeah, what, what, what we have is uh, when people call, we ask them to, we have a couple options. Do you um, have a protocol that you follow? Right, we have a, have a design protocol, and we screen questions based on, a lot of them just call for information, and so we'll send them the information. They complain of um, sort of health-related issue, and we follow up with that. With can a, can with you a provide the community uh, with a script of what you, what you, you have a written script that people... Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we're doing the same thing in America. We have, a, we have a hotline similar to Virginia where people can call a report okay problems or fish with lesions they can uh, they they also are urged to call their local doctor or local health department but they also have a number where they can call the state health department and get information on fish kill neurological problems mr chairman dr jenkins informs me that we're using maryland's questionnaire so we are beginning i mean all the states are coming together around um forming this way this protocol if you will standard protocol for information and also i'd like to say that uh, next week, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is uh, a group of state health officials to work on a common case definition for this, because that's really the first step in defining the syndrome, is to come up with the case de definition, and I'd like to thank the Centers for Disease Control for doing that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the next hearing witnesses for their patience, because uh, we are going to proceed a little longer with this excellent panel. We're, I think we're just really trying to sort out a framework for uh, all the different elements. I mean, there's so many elements to this issue. Uh, Mr. Allen, you have the floor, and then we'll go to you, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you. I, I want to ask you about the state of the research uh, that's out there, and in particular, uh, I understand that no birds or other animals that might feed a fish, I mean, birds or, or uh, turtles, I mean, that, that there's been no research conducted on, on those kinds of Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I understand there's been no harm that we can detect to birds or turtles or fish uh, that eat the infected, the infected fish. So what I'm wondering is, should there be some research dir directed at, at uh, birds? And I was thinking, you know, the birds migrate. I mean, they're, they're here and they're gone. And how do we, uh, would it be helpful to advancing our, our understanding of uh, effects on humans to figure out a way to do more research related to turtles or birds. Uh, the the uh, chairman began this hearing with a reference to the canary in the mind, and uh, so I just wanted to put that out for all of you. Well, I, I would like to, to clarify that, or suggest that probably, the, in my opinion, one of the best ways to go about that would to be, be to find, first of all, organisms that are consuming toxic bisteria cells and see whether they have any or whether, or whether fish that are fed, their tissues have problems before we can move to birds. Because right now, again, the status of our knowledge about the toxins is so poor that it would be much harder to go after birds, although that should be done in the future once we have better tools. So we're working right now with the Food and Drug Administration, and some of those folks are here, to provide them with oysters that we've deliberately fed toxic feasteria to to see whether these kinds of uh, at least... Um, Primitive tests can indicate to us that fish that are fed tissues from these oysters that we know have harbored a lot of toxic feasteria cells yeah. are having problems or 
become sick or die. So that's a first step. And, and, and once we have these toxins, which um, thanks again to the, inter to the um, National Marine Fisheries Service Biotoxins uh, Center and also intramural program of NIHS, we're really close to having at least one of the major toxins characterized. Once we have that, we can do a lot better. But in the meantime, we are conducting as much research uh, effort as we, as we can at this point. Additional funding would certainly help that. Anyone else? But just my, I, one of the disadvantages, one of the hard things about the, these hearings for us is that we're running in and out. Sometimes in the course of a hearing, you, uh, you know, you've given a statement, you've listened to uh, some of the conversation. Is there anything that any of you is bursting to say, but you don't, haven't been asked the question? I didn't want to leave my time without, without giving you that opportunity. I meant to clarify something that, that um, Congressman Gilchrist brought up, but I, I, I remember he was asking some questions about nutrient. The status of nutrient research on Feasteria has, through eight years of experiments in the laboratory and some field uh, observations as well, clarified that Feasteria can be strongly stimulated by both organic and inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus. Beyond that, it becomes more of a specific river-by-river river approach because one has to consider flow characteristics. If there's a lot of flushing, Feasteria can't take hold. Um, it has to consider also the availability of fish, the salinity and temperature. But clearly, both phosphorus and nitrogen can stimulate Feasteria. Just to clarify for you, sir. Thank you. Good. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. I just, uh, I just have a couple questions, and perhaps uh, one of the uh, Public health officials could you answer. Talk just a little louder, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a few questions, and uh, perhaps one of the public health officials could answer it. Uh, you've, your testimony well establishes your concern about uh, the uh, possible harmful effects of uh, human exposure. Now, what what kind of research has been done? or surveys or assessments have been done to determine whether or not uh, contaminated fish have actually spread to the marketplace? Ha are there like spot checks that have been done at, um, at uh, food, ch you know, in restaurants or food chains or fast food places? Whoever buys this, uh, buys fish and then uses them for a commercial uh, purpose? I mean, is there any way to determine if that, if, if... I think as soon as they will identify for us, and I understand they're getting quite clear, the uh, nature of the toxin so we can measure it, that kind of thing might be done. But I, I'm unaware of how you would do that uh, now. I could add that um, both, at least in the experiences of Maryland and then as a Marine Fisheries Commissioner trying to work with fishermen in North Carolina, Fishermen are trying to be very careful because they do value their markets. They're not sending fish to markets that have open bleeding sores or look otherwise affected. In Maryland's case, it's it, again, it's a step further. Maryland's shutting down estuaries that are known to have been affected by Feasteria so that those fish cannot be marketed. That doesn't help you much on diagnostics, as Dr. Bruton said. We need the toxins characterized to say for sure that fish are safe, but at least it might help in terms of the market right now. And you might have missed another thing Dr. Burkholder said earlier. Uh, she suspects that this toxin is uh, so dangerous to the fish that those fish that get exposed probably get killed and probably don't make it to the market. They, they, they probably are. They die fast. This, this, this is a bad poison. Fish are, yes, it's as Dr. Bruton says, fish are so quickly and so badly affected by this that the skin begins or the behavior becomes very erratic where they begin to die or they develop open bleeding sores. And we've told folks, no matter what is causing that kind of problem, don't eat a fish that doesn't look healthy. Um, and, and fishermen are very cognizant of that problem, too. Do, do other fish eat those fish that then? They seem to, and wild, other wildlife seem to, without any ill effects that we know of, but all that still seems to, needs to be teased apart with research. She's uh, pointed out that in her uh, aquaria, where she's got the uh, organism to a frenzy putting out toxic uh, toxins, 
She can put fish in there and they'll just bam, kill them. It's a bad poison. Uh, again, my you know my concern from uh, a consumer standpoint would be if any contaminated fish would be in a marketplace, and so there's not really. Is there any way to test that? I mean, could you do you know if there was? Uh, I'm not asking that you do that. But any way to test that to go to a uh, like a fish market or to go to a uh, place where they're selling fish to determine if these toxins were still there? Do these toxins stay in in that fish if they're in any way contaminated? Unfortunately, that would be like asking you if you had PCV poisonings, but you didn't know what PCV were, so you really couldn't track it. In other words, we don't know the chemical identity of these toxins, so we cannot say whether they're in tissues, where they go, how they're broken down, whether the breakdown products are worse or, or better, uh, less toxic or more toxic than the original toxins. All we can go by right now is um, some collaborations we're beginning to develop with the FDA, as I mentioned, and also with NIMS Charleston's Marine Biotoxin Center to, and, and NIHS intramural program to get these toxins characterized with such a, an important step. And then, to, and then to proceed as best we can with, without that knowledge, we're, we're working with the Food and Drug Administration on oysters that are affected right now and doing the kinds of primitive tests I've just described. Um, obviously, and in my own lab, we have prioritized trying to get enough material for toxin analysis to an absolute top priority. That's ahead of the research that I care about the most myself. Researcher, my research associate really would like to identify the substances in fish secreta that stimulate toxin production, but we've put all the nutritional ecology based on, it on hold. It's a critical thing to get the toxins characterized. Thank you. I'm wrestling with um, a number of issues, but one is to, to bring some sense to this hearing and some purpose. Uh, and it's very clear this is just a gigantic issue, not that we're going to resolve in one hearing. So I feel a little more relaxed just thinking, well, we're kind of serving the ball into play. I mean, one of the things that we could just focus in on is uh, how government responded to this. Uh, and that's very important. How does the state, how did it, how did the state respond? you know, how quickly has the federal government gotten involved, the health officials and so on, and we'll look at that. Uh, we, we need to look, it seems to me, I mean, I, as you think about it, we, there's nothing definitive as to why people are unhealthy, but I think we can establish uh, the fact that some people are very unhealthy um, in these fish kill areas and because of, the to because of toxin hysteria. And I gather that they would, would uh, you know, the question is, is it the eating of it or is it uh, in the, in the air through the mist? I mean, these are issues. Do you feel you have much of a handle on, or do, do we, is it open? And Dr. It's a, Dr. A, lot of, a lot of it's still open. Again, I think what you come back to is that what our medical team was initially asked was one single question, is are there human health effects associated? Are there what? Are there human health effects right. associated with exposure to the hysteria? Our answer is yes, there right. are. Um, then the question is how, you know, how does it happen? And again, I can tell you that our, our, our data suggests that we're dealing probably with the respiratory route, inhalation of aerosols, skin contact. There are no data to suggest that it has anything to do with food consumption. But again, we are right on the edge of our knowledge. And, and it appears that the health consequences uh, over time fade away, that they aren't lasting. I mean, I realized that the only was, excuse me, your, that, when you do that with your eyebrow, it doesn't show up in the transcript. <laughs> 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 You're free to I interrupt can, me. <laughs> the transcript. I, 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 I will try to put it. In the the um, transcript will note that one eyebrow <laughs> went up, one went down, and the chin went a little sideways. Um, what we are, what we have looked at is a window in time. Uh, you've got to remember we saw our first patient on August 22nd. Okay. Um, we saw patients at that time who were close to a month away from their exposure to the water, and they still had clearly demonstrable. Um, objective findings in terms of impairment in, in memory and learning. Okay. Um, we do not know how long these symptoms last. Dr. Burkholter in her laboratory, again, has reported three to four months. The bulk of the symptoms appeared to resolve. Uh, yes, in, in about three to four months, most of the symptoms had, had resolved, accepting that up to six years in one case, four years in another case, ongoing, and three years in a third case, 
the three most seriously affected people have relapsed symptoms that recur following strenuous exercise. Those symptoms have ranged from foggy memory and short-term memory loss to burning sensation and, and um, autonomic nervous system problems, uh, and, and on one case, uh, suggestion of immune system impairment, ongoing respiratory problems, um, uh, multiple cases of pneumonia, following exposure to these toxins. Again, I'd like to stress that, that it's not going to be very to see more effects at this point than the Maryland team is seeing because we can't give better diagnostics to these folks. It's just like the question that just happened to fish. We need these toxins characterized to really be able to go in and do a better job of determining whether it's just short loss and cognitive impairment field, learning disability, or there are other symptoms. Certainly in the laboratory, have suffered long-term relapsed effects. I'm going to just uh, ask you to clarify one thing. I'm going to ask you, uh, Mr. to uh, answer. I'm hung up on this, but incredibly pin it down. My that there'd be a billion fish in a 20 square mile. A billion is just not, I mean, I, not to be funny, but uh, a lot of fish, fish, if you have a billion fish in 20 square miles, and all of them eventually died. Uh, so you, I want you to tell me why you use that number, because frankly, if you invented that number, I could say government officials would start to say, well, you know, she's not too precise be precise. Where did that, that number come from? That number came from Department of Environment, Health, and Natural Resources Division of Environmental Management Personnel. Okay. Over a six-week, certainly a billion, it's hard to get a, conceive of a dying in a 20 square at one time. These died over a, over a six to eight-week period, eight weeks in some of these areas that were affected within this 20 square stretch, and six weeks in others. It's quite analogous if you consider it to the Pokemon in some respects. The fish were very small. And, and you, you have no idea, it's hard to imagine right. how many small fish there I are know. in a fish web that, okay. that, that could die even without our noticing. You're talking fingernail size in some way. Five okay. inches, so, so very tiny fish, not big flounder or something like that. Make an analogy, Mr. Barker. Hey, you're, you're kind of like a legislator, and I think we're all and we're trying to grasp, we basically um, become special key areas where we focus most of our time and attention. How much time did you spend researching on your book and before you wrote? How much, was this a year's worth of total absorption, a half a year? Yeah. Um, on environmental stories, it's hard to know where to end, go on forever. In the story, I decided to commit one year of following the story, writing the background. Dr. Bergholder's experience and tracing events as they developed over the course of that year. So I spent about 14 months uh, on this particular story. And when you started, you became an expert on this issue. Frankly, you did. Uh, Some may debate that. And, and in the course of doing this, uh, to me, was the story worse than you thought it was going to be in terms of, of the significance of it and better in a sense to write a book about? Mm -hmm. or there not as much to the story as you got into it. Describe to me, the more you got into it, what, what did you begin to see? Uh, well, see about government, right. see about Congress. Appreciate that. Um, I started out thinking it was going to be one kind of a book and really somewhat of another. I thought it would be a book about Dr. Burkle, about her particular experiences um, in the laboratory um, with this organism and discovering it, um, tracing it to the causes. Pretty much as a straightforward um, environmental scientific story. Um, it was I heard about her experiences with some of the state agencies, I began to realize there was another dimension to the story, and that is the bureaucratic response. Uh, and one of the an investigative author has over investigative journalists be on a story for a certain period of time. You develop a reputation, you develop rapport and trust. People come out of work and will talk to you. And I found there were a lot of people who were frustrated with the state agency. Dr. Holder was not alone. And they would share information, they would share experience. At times they would share files with me. I had to protect a number of those sources too. And I began to realize this was a classic, what I felt to be classic bureaucratic story. And there was dimensions of negligence, dimensions of incompetence, 
I felt. And at times, I wondered if there wasn't even a cover-up involved in that. Uh, and then also in terms of the human health well, effects. Well, when you answer that last one, did you think there was a cover-up? Did you think it was more bureaucratic? I, I ended up feeling that there's hard to distinction between collusion and cover-up. I think that various people had different is interests in it. Um, and you never get that memory to cover up anyhow. So thinking that not be the case. Um, but then um, the, the human health effects. I mean, certainly Dr. Burke her experience, and I went out on the rivers and talked to people who they themselves And that, that you didn't expect another element of surprise? Well, what was is that these people would talk to me because um, a lot of people who have experienced health effects coming out in the front lines on the river there don't see it to actually report them. Perhaps because it will close the rivers to um, and commercial fishing, it'll affect their livelihood. A number of them had already felt they reported those effects to agencies. Um, also, the, there was just a fragmentary sort of approach to the health problem. Um, they had not done a real good job on it. Um, um, certain agencies um, can be very skeptical of Dr. Brooks' findings. Uh, I saw it as an opportunity to sort of investigate those effects and bring it to, to the state of knowledge, and I could not prove the events that we're getting here now in Maryland, but uh, uh, really that's why my testimony earlier, I mean, I shouldn't have been the one to go out and do this kind of work. I'm glad that I'm proud that I did, um, but um, it indicates a breakdown. Okay, thank you. Wayne? Just a couple of quick questions. Um, when you say questions, they may have long answers, so you yeah, have a sure. couple of questions. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Chairman. C could you um, tell us about Jorgensen and her okay. For the record, Mrs. Jorgensen, whose experience I characterize in the prologue to the book, and she, um, her family was in Carolina um, from Maryland, happened to wander to a fish kill, um, went home and began a variety of symptoms. Her, her in trying to find explanation and how she finally put together a and circumstantial connection with North Carolina, and then her efforts to try to get information from North Carolina officials. And not only she had these problems, too. The best answer to that question, um, when you in my position where people are sharing information and experience you, that they trust um, you with, uh, one of the things you find, yourself into, um, you find yourself involved in is that, listen, if information that I continue effects, it could paint my children, it could affect my livelihood, the impression I'm not fully recovered, the stigma associated with it. So on one hand, I encourage you to, to dramatize these effects um, and public attention token when asked if I'm suffering from effects, I'd like you to say that um, I'm pretty much recovered. This, um, just for the chairman's sure. sake, apparently, I haven't read the book, but, book, but she apparently with a similar health effects, neurological problems that have been described here earlier. Right. Is she um, fine now? Is, are they, uh, have they been treated and... I thought I... Yeah, uh, <sighs> that's her, uh, well, that's fine. I'll move on to that. Thank you. I uh, hope everything turns out right. Um, it, knowing the experience of someone that actually walks into a situation, uh, an enormous amount of to resolve, uh, say um, that the, the protocol now, uh, and any, anybody can answer this, the protocol now for information with anybody with similar symptoms uh, is as good as we can make it up to this point. Dr. Bruton? I don't know. We, we 1 800 uh, number and are receiving calls. And uh, so, customers, whatever, to uh, review, uh, we have called a, a panel now for Maryland to invest. So, good coordination now between a number of states for, toward the medical rate. I, I, I think, however, recognition. Um, this is tough work. And a lot deals with the populations that we're dealing with. These are watermen. Um, they frequently are a just barely break-even, self-employed, most 
do not have medical insurance. They tend to be very um, And consequently, what we have found are not the types who like to call independent numbers. What if some does, however, call a one number, they're a waterman or somebody that has no health insurance? What would what happens in North Carolina? If it appears that this might be mysterious. In Maryland, we route them in uh, our group and are examined for charge. Now, the state is they're going to pick up the bill. We're still discussing it with them, oh, that's good. <laughs> at least at, at an acute level. And, but this raises some very difficult questions. And a lot of these people need very complicated medical evaluations that cost a lot of money. And this, I will tell you the state of Wasserman, if he would hear, would win because, um, you know, there are clear problems as to where the money is going to come from. And how are you going to get a man who's barely breaking even, who works hard all day, you know, who's right at the poverty line, barely keeping his family afloat, has no health insurance, and if he's going to go see a doctor, you're talking about the possibility that he's going to require expensive tests. He can't afford any of those. You're talking about possibly that you're going to shut down his river, and he's not going to continue to work. And, and so not only, I mean, there, there are a tremendous number of reasons why, you know, people do not come forward with these reports. And, and I think what has to happen in the case in the Pocomo, the symptoms became so clear that finally the health department was able to put together a group of patients. And again, it was only when we saw a group of patients. I will say if I had seen some patient individually, there is a fair chance I would have shrugged and said, ah, there's nothing there. Um, but it, it finally, in some ways, it was the magnitude of this outbreak that, that allowed us to get this information. But this is tough stuff. I guess there's similar situations in Dr. Burkholder. I really would like to support what Dr. Morris has just said about the hotline, too. Fishermen are an extremely closed group of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't trust just anybody, and it takes years sometimes to gain their trust. They're the last folks I know who, unless things are desperate and they're very, very sick, They've just given up. They're the last people I know who'd want to call a hotline. Mr. Gilchrist, what I'm not hearing, I don't think you are either, is why we're not hearing from Virginia and North Carolina. Okay, Maryland, obviously your techniques were successful. We are going to model our inquiry after your inquiry. We are going to go out and look at our potential victims the same way you have and see if our data turns up the same thing. I thought yeah. we'd said that over and over. Yeah, and, and let me also say that I, I made the point earlier, and, and no, I, I just wanted, I didn't hear what you said, Dr. Bruton. First, what did you say? I thought uh, I had said several times about the uh, comparable protocols, about the uh, right. uh, use of uh, the Maryland experience to inform ours, uh, the way that we would have to do uh, uh, studies that were yeah. well, close just, enough together yeah. Yeah. that they could add uh, to, uh, uh, he has a, uh, solid information on a few uh, patients. We collect information the same way that we'll be able to add to those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I what, think what, that went yeah. all through my testimony. The gentleman yield. I, 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 one of the things I, I decided to avoid because I'm not sure, given all the things we could talk about, how constructive it is to compare what North Carolina has done or Virginia or or Maryland in any great depth, but it does strike me that Maryland's the new kid on the block, but they seem to be a little more aggressive. I basically take that, that they learn from some of your mistakes, candidly, uh, and, and so I give them credit for that, and, and, and it, it would be well taken for, and I think there is communication. So I, I made a decision, frankly, to, to not get into this in this public hearing um, for a variety of reasons. Um, because we just have so much to cover. But I do, I do think this, that um, there are a lot of things we don't know. But one thing that every state could be doing better, and maybe is taking the lead, that's uh, better communication with its constituency, better record keeping, better documentation of what truly is happening. And I think it's very instructive to put on the record that fishermen are a hardy group, and they're not going to tell you things. I mean, they're going to go out when they're sick. So, and they're not even necessarily going to notice when they're, when they're, the difference is. But I also know they have a vested interest, if they're commercial fishermen in particular, to not want to destroy their industry. And it must be a very scary thing when they question their own health and they question their own livelihood. 
Um, so this is a very big issue. Uh, I do see some significant differences between um, the hysteria that might have happened with uh, leukemia for kids next to transmission lines and what's happening here. I see closer parallels to what we have with the Gulf War, and that is we do have some sick people, and we're almost denying that they're sick. And, 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 um, and I, 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 I'm fearful that we may try to wait too much till the science catches up to some, some things that are happening uh, out there. Yeah. Mr. Chase, let me just um, again say that Virginia and Maryland is somewhat different in that my understanding is that, that the watermen actually did come forward uh, to Maryland and that, that they had a cohort of watermen who, and others, I guess, who were complaining of symptoms. Yeah, but, but maybe the thing is that nobody's complaining in Virginia, but maybe you have the same basic problem that they have in Maryland. Well, and that's that's uh, yeah. what would concern let me, me. Let me, yeah, we, we're obviously concerned about that as well. What's the uh, difference here? And, and let uh, me reiterate uh, yeah. a point I made earlier that one of the the strengths of the public health system in Virginia is our local health departments, and we have our environmental health specialists, for example, are very tied into the community, especially on the eastern shore. We have one. One person there who, well, actually the director grew up on the Eastern Shore, and he's very well trusted. And I think trust, as has been mentioned here, is very important to these watermen. And the environmental health specialist who has been sort of the, the lead person on trying to, to uncover if there are any complaints grew up there. He's well trusted by the watermen, by the community. Uh, right. And so we are doing things besides just this 1-800 hotline. Um, what, what, what leaves me a little uneasy is that you really, you, you adopted the Maryland protocol, but, but um, uh, I'm just uneasy that you really haven't, do you have your own, maybe you've adopted their protocol, but it's, it's now your protocol, and you should have something in writing, and I'm, I'm not sure that uh, on the local level, if uh, I don't get the sense that there's necessarily any great coordination from the local to the state level from what you've described. Oh, there is. We, we we're in contact daily with the local health department there, and, and actually our local health department between Maryland and Virginia is that our okay. local health department is actually part of the state health department. Uh, we have, you know, we're connected electronically, and I receive as, okay. you know, the, basically the commissioner of health overseeing 4,000 employees, I receive electronic notes um, directly from the environmental health specialists out there because we're, you know, communication is spontaneous. So. You all have been, all your statements were very helpful, and you have launched uh, this committee into an area that maybe we should have gotten into a little sooner. Uh, and it is sad that a book had to be written before uh, people woke up, and I include us. I include Congress. I mean, you know, this is our responsibility, too. So, um, um, I thank you for that. I'll just allow any of you to, to end with any closing comment, if you'd like, and then we'll get, uh, we're going to close this hearing, and we'll that uh, new hearing. Yes, Mr. Barker. Final comment for me. Thank you very much. Um, there's been a real air of collegiality to this proceedings, and the impression is that all interested parties are going to work together. Um, that would appear to give us a reason for optimism, but beneath the surface, I think there's some real divisions. There are disagreements and differences on data, um, and we've only scratched the very large and powerful interests that are going to be challenged in terms of meeting the nutrient cleanup, if that's what it takes. Um, and we cannot proceed with business as usual when we're talking about big business here. So I would, I would ask this committee, I would thank them for their interest and their involvement, and I would ask them to continue it and sustain it if federal monies are available. Um, the money grab is already on, I understand, um, that you follow up on your interest perhaps well, by holding it. They shouldn't be so hearing. pessimistic. It's not money grab. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you, you've given a very eloquent statement and yeah. when you started and when you ended, and I want to yeah. assure you, one, that this is the first hearing. And in the first hearing, we're not going to get into some of the detail. And we, we'll have small parties and we'll have a little more action. But it's not a money grab. I mean, this is a si sincere effort to try to make sure we get money in different places that's needed. Perhaps so, I, yeah, yeah. I, I apologize. And you don't need to apologize. What do you mean by money well, grab? Well, that the monies that have been are being loosened up for posterior research, um, that there are um, efforts on various parts of science, scientists and scientific institutions to angle for that, and there's competition for that money. That's what I meant about money This grab. is what you can do to a that will do a great job, that you'll write a book about what we do if we fail. <laughs> I hope so. And I don't want you to do that, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you report you back to us in a, in a few months and see how we're doing here. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yes. I would just um, like to extend my very deep appreciation.
Commission for your interest in this issue. I've cared about this issue for a long time, and, and it's really wonderful, sir. I think you've done a terrific job here in your committee, and, and you yourself are to be commended for all the time and the interest you're showing this issue. Well, we're, we're learning, and we thank you. Anyone else? It doesn't need to be a compliment. I guess I, I, guess I, I and well, maybe I sent the wrong message. Uh, Rod started to be a little critical, and I jumped on him, so maybe you thought that was... <laughs> Well, Sorry. Probably about that. shouldn't pass up the opportunity to suck up. I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> you really have done a great job. With, with, is that that will be the last comment for the record? <laughs> and I am just going to do a business. Uh, just if you'd stay seated a second, uh, um, just to put in the re record a letter from from Solutions to Avoid Red Tide Inc. Uh, put in the record a letter from South Carolina Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Quality Control. A letter from Chairperson of Pamlico uh, County, is it proper, is that how we say it, Pamlico uh, County, North Carolina Board of Commissioners, a letter from uh, Pamlico uh, County, North Carolina Health Director, and a letter from the Executive Vice President of the National Fisheries Institute. Uh, those will be put in the record. And uh, we thank you very much for coming to this hearing and your participation, and uh, uh, we'll call this hearing closed. Now, we got a new hearing. Yeah. Do, what kind of boats do we have? Uh, most of That's not a good sign. They usually keep doing those. Two hours. Oh. I'd like to call this new hearing to order and to welcome our, our panelists, our witnesses, and our, our guests, and to uh, do a very needed approach to uh, um, five very important government officials who have kind of screwed their day up here trying to accommodate our needs, and I thank you uh, very sincerely. Um, as you know, we swear you in, uh, as we swear in all our witnesses, we could ask you to stand. Uh, but first, let me see who is present at this meeting. Uh, we have Mary Garcia, Acting Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Atmosphere, Department of Commerce, Kenneth Olden, MD, Director, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, National Institutes of Health, uh, Fred Shank, PhD, Director, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, Food and Drug Administration, Richard Jackson, MD, Director, National Center for Environmental Health, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and uh, Robert Whalen, Director, Office of Wetlands, Oceans, and Watersheds, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We have five very distinguished people before us, and I thank you. And let me say, if you think someone else might respond to a question, that would be helpful. Uh, I'm sorry, you stood up twice now, and I... <laughs> I'm anxious. But we'll all stand up. I just say, if there's anyone else who should be standing as well to be sworn in, is there anyone else you might call on to answer a question? It may not happen, but if you don't mind, that helps. Uh, that way, you have to do it again. If you'd raise your, your right arm, uh, right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, 
Maybe you all knew it or maybe you didn't, but uh, we have had uh, one procedural vote after another. There are a few protests on the floor of the House, and uh, without passing judgment on why that's happening, the bottom line is that we've had to go to the floor on many occasions, right in the middle of uh, debates and so on. Um, Mr. Garcia, I'm going to um, uh, have you start, and uh, we'll go just in the order and guests in which I called you and uh, welcome you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could ask permission that my written statement be inserted yeah. into the record, I'll summarize for you. Okay, that without objection. Uh, your, your written record will be submitted in the record. Thank you. Um, at the outset, I'd like to emphasize that the microbe that we are discussing today is but one of a large harmful species that are increasing in abundance and intensity in the coastal waters, both domestically and internationally. As you can see from the map that I've brought along, which is on the easel uh, to my right, these harmful algal blooms, including red tides in the Gulf of Mexico in the southeast, brown tides in New York and Texas, shellfish poisonings in the Gulf of Maine, the Pacific Northwest, and Alaska, impact nearly every coastal state and have been responsible for considerable economic losses estimated conservatively at $1 billion in the past decade. Uh, even today, we're monitoring a new event, a red tide off the coast of Texas. While the specific conditions causing these blooms may vary from species to species, worldwide trends show increases in both frequency and intensity, forcing us to look for some common underlying causes, including polluted runoff. Therefore, efforts to prevent, control, and mitigate impacts of hysteria in the mid-Atlantic region must be done in the context of causes and consequences of this broader set of harmful blooms. In response to recent hysteria outbreaks, we're working closely with states, the White House, and other federal agencies to ensure that any action the Department of Commerce and NOAA take is coordinated, effective, and responsive to needs. NOAA's Chesapeake Bay office is coordinating federal activities in the Bay, including a state-federal effort of weekly to biweekly monitoring and assessment as well as near-term research. NOAA has also provided a research vessel and staff to assist in the required SWAT team approach adopted by Maryland uh, to respond to reported fish lesions and fish kill events. NOAA scientists serving on Maryland's Technical Advisory Committee are providing expert advice and guidance to the state on responses to blooms in the Pocomoke and other Bay tributaries on critical data. Maryland and Virginia State programs are providing advice and outreach to officials, commercial fishermen, and the public. In the past five years, NOAA has supported research and outreach activities on harm technology, emphasizing causes and ways to reduce their impacts on coastal resources and economies. The NOAA Maryland Cooperative Oxford Laboratory is collaborating with the University of Maryland researchers to determine possible linkages between lesions and lesion-causing substances in the affected waters. Our Charleston Laboratory is working in partnership with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and North Carolina State University to identify and purify the toxin paving the way for routine methods of field detection of the Fisteria toxin and for performing critical experiments that determine susceptibility and seafood safety. NOAA's Beaufort Laboratory has been collaborating with Dr. Burkholder on identifying conditions supporting growth of non-toxic Fisteria, and which is the most prevalent life stage of this organism in the coastal systems. These data are essential to understanding optimal growth conditions for this species, and ultimately preventing or at least predicting the onset of blooms. Through the NOAA Sea Grant, a probe to identify Fisteria was developed and in effective waters. However, as I indicated a moment ago, Fisteria is symptomatic of a growing national problem of polluted runoff and harmful algal blooms. NOAA has led development of a multi agency research program on the ecology and oceanography of harmful algal blooms, known as ECOHAB, with the National Science Foundation, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Office of Naval Research. This is the first interagency federal research program focused exclusively on determining factors responsible for blooms of harmful algae in U.S. coastal waters, developing predictive capabilities to aid in forecasting bloom events, mm -hmm. and guiding effective management and control policies. NOAA and EPA are currently leading a national effort directed by the White House and coordinated with state and academic scientists to expand on this ECOHAB model and develop short-term and long-term research strategies on understanding and assessing the causes and consequences of hysteria and other harm issues. This research will provide an improved scientific basis for implementing control and mitigation strategies. Nitrogen is a pivotal plant in the Chesapeake Bay. Considerable effort has been placed on improving water quality by controlling loads to the system, and there's growing evidence that it may play an important role in the hysteria blooms. 
was assisting in the regional analysis of water quality and loading data in the Chesapeake. With the millions of dollars that are being spent on reducing, rather, reducing nutrient loads in the Bay, uh, our role in determining the response to manage provides a barometer of our success and therefore critical baseline information for likely success of hysteria in the system. NOAA's National Coastal Zone Management Program provides a mechanism for states to translate this information into management actions. As evidence grows that these and other blooms are stimulated by non-point sources of nutrients, our efforts with the Environmental Protection Agency through the Coastal Zone Management's non-point pollution control program will be critical. The development of state coastal non-point programs has provided a roadmap of what we need to do, identifying existing tools and areas where more will be needed. As we move forward in dealing with fisteria and other harmful blooms, NOAA will continue working with the states and other federal agencies on monitoring the Chesapeake Bay, developing an interagency research program within Ecohab toward understanding and predicting conditions during hysteria development and toxicity as a part of the national approach to harmful algal blooms, continuing work in our laboratories with other agencies to develop an integrated, coordinated program to ensure safeguards and seafood safety assisting coastal states in further developing and implementing programs to control pollution runoff, and expanding outreach efforts to ensure that managers, researchers, the general public can make informed decisions dealing with fish kills, lesions, and regards to public safety. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. Dr. Olden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're uh, amazing. You have such a loud voice. That mic doesn't even have to be. <laughs> you're the first, I you're the first the witness. <laughs> I thank you for the opportunity before this distinguished panel. The important work that is supported in health sciences that is directly related to hysteria. However, before I begin, I want to emphasize that the research is supported by other institutes of the NIH, most notably allergy and infectious diseases, arthritis and musculoskeletal and skin diseases, and mental health. Research supported by these three institutes is also highly relevant to the issues and the health threat posed by hysteria. NIEHS is a federal biomedical research facility located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Our mission is to reduce the burden of human illness and dysfunction by understanding how environmental exposures affect our health, how individuals differ in their susceptibility to these exposures and how these susceptibilities change over time. In other words, our mission is to provide the critical science needed to make uh, intelligent environmental regulatory decisions. To, did, to do this research, uh, uh, we emphasize basic laboratory studies, toxicological testing, epidemiologic studies, and clinical and intervention studies. We conduct research through a variety of mechanisms, including intramural research program with the staff in North Carolina. We provide grants to university scientists throughout the country, contracts and collaborations with many of the federal partners that are even are at the table today. We also have a centers program that is relevant to today's discussion that provides necessary core support for interdisciplinary research in particular areas of emphasis. We pr provide support to five marine and freshwater biomedical research centers, uh, and two of those uh, have substantial research efforts that deal directly with hysteria. NIEHS hysteria research strategy focuses on identifying the toxins and their associated biological <coughs> effects and on producing these toxins in sufficient quantity to allow purification and distribution of standardized material. Accomplishing this research will, this work will allow researchers to characterize the toxicology of these compounds, to develop diagnostic, therapeutic, and preventive strategies, and to conduct epidemiologic studies that accurately define the true human exposures and health effects arise, arising from hysteria toxins. Outgrowth of this research could also lead to development of biomarkers for use in early detection of these microbes. 
The work that the Institute does is complemented by related studies at other federal agencies, including those seated here today, that could lead to uh, identification of the growth conditions uh, uh, that stimulate not only the growth of uh, fisteria, but also the toxin production. Two of our marine centers, uh, uh, one at the University of Miami in Florida, and the other at Duke University in North Carolina, uh, have research that's highly relevant, and I will report on that work here today. Uh, the center, Miami, has worked for a number of years on marine toxins. It has been engaged in isolating and characterizing the putative hysteria toxins. Working with samples provided by researchers at North Carolina State University, Dr. Burkhalder and her associates, and scientists from the NIEHS, uh, the University of Miami researchers have isolated a hysteria toxin of the lipid-soluble type. The lipid-soluble toxin has been termed noga toxin, by, based on uh, one of Dr. Burkhalder's colleagues, and it is the uh, dermonecrotic factor. It is the, the one that causes the skin sores and the rashes. It is thought by some to cause skin lesions in humans, and there are reports now that it delaminates fish tissue rapidly, which means it melts away the various layers. It, it dissolves the cement, laminate between those layers. A second, more water-soluble toxin, which has been isolated by Dr. Burkholder and her colleagues at uh, NOAA and NIEHS, is thought to possess the neurotoxic activity. It is thought by some that it is responsible for the memory deficits exhibited by persons exposed in the laboratory and in the field. However, to date, there is very little peer-reviewed literature to support the human health claims and few laboratory animal studies. The lipid soluble fraction has been purified to near homogeneity now by Dr. Dan Baden in the Miami laboratory and Dr. Burkhalder and her colleagues at NIEHS and NOAA are close, have made similar progress on the water soluble fraction. So the prediction is that we should have at least two purified fractions that we could begin to do toxicology on in the near future. NIEHS is providing a $400,000 supplement to our Marine and Freshwater Biomedical Research Science Center at Miami. The supplement will allow the center investigators to pursue more aggressively the purification and chemical characterization of the two uh, toxin uh, species. The plans are to collaborate with uh, Dr. Morris and his colleagues at the University of Maryland to investigate the human health effects at the University of Maryland and the physicians at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and this is, as you've heard, very crucial and important research. The Duke University Center uh, has been focusing on the, uh, the water-soluble toxin, and uh, they have prepared extracts from hysteria, and they have injected the, they have done looked at the effects of the toxin on cells and culture, and they have injected uh, the toxin extracts into rats, and they discover that uh, their le learning behavior, their capacity to learn new uh, uh, activities is greatly reduced. Now, I emphasize that this is uh, preliminary data and is yet uh, to be peer reviewed. Now, NIEHS intramural research program has played an important role in fostering collaborations on fisteria research. The intramural program has provided a neutral forum for many people, including I think all the witnesses that have gone through here today, uh, to get together to talk about the gaps and to focus on the science. Uh, as uh, the chronology of events will indicate, we have been involved, and IEHS has been involved with Dr. Burkholder and her associates since 1991, which is when she first made the discovery. Some examples of what we've done, in, in addition to participating in the purification of one of the fractions, we organized a series of seminars in 1996 in which we invited the prominent researchers in the field 
to come and participate and talk to each other. And uh, based on that, some collaborations evolved. Uh, in fact, uh, the Institute provided, based on those discussions, a laboratory where North Carolina State University scientist, Dr. Burke Holder and her colleagues, a scientist from National Marine Fisheries Service in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a NOAA-supported research center, and scientists from the NIEHS have come together to develop, uh, to begin to isolate hysteria toxin. I didn't say at the outset, but the National Toxicology Program is also in the NIEHS. And we, so we are, we're, are trying to purify adequate quantities of both toxins so we can do, uh, test the toxicity in uh, neurotoxicity assays developed uh, in the rodent bioassay system. Uh, just this August, August 23rd through the 24th of this year. Uh, Doctor, let me ask you, do you have, how much more do you have? I just want to make sure we cover this. Uh, I think you got too many papers there. <laughs> well, I can shorten it because yeah. I was going to talk about the human health effects, which Dr. Morris, I believe, has already yeah, spoke well, about. I do want you to talk about the human health effects, but not in four pages. All right. So can you talk a little about it? And not well, let me just say that uh, 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 the, the I'm sorry to interrupt your train of thought. No, no, I just that's all right. So take a second just to, but what I would like is well, to. Yeah. I, I think Dr. Morris has reported on this, but he and his colleagues at the University of Maryland, and, and I guess with the Johns Hopkins group, have studied 30 patients extensively, uh, approximately 30. I think the real number is 28. This includes uh, PET scans, and what we needed was, in the field, was uh, uh, an objective, uh, quantifiable assessment of the human health effects. And Dr. Morris and his colleagues have the first such study. And they use uh, a PET scan, they use cognitive function tests and memory tests. Uh, and they use residents from uh, a similar community, from the Oceanside community, as controls. And they reached several, five, tentative conclusions. First, they concluded that their exposures causes acute dementia that lasts 24 to 72 hours. That's important. That's similar to what Dr. Burkhalder had reported. Uh, the uh, acute phase is followed by a more protracted period characterized by confusion and difficulty and short-term memory that the Fisteria exposed group had abnormal PET scans, and that seems to me to be the most solid and hard information here, and that the learning effect was severe. And lastly, that the intoxication occurred, or appeared to occur, both by inhalation uh, and by direct scan contact to Fisteria-laden uh, water. I, I think... Uh, uh, I, I will stop at that. And no, thank that, you. That, that's helpful. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Doctor Shank. I, one of my interests is um, is to make sure I clearly get all of you on the record before the next bell, because I don't have the courage to ask you to stay for another uh, wait. Um, so let's see. Let's get through, and then let's let's have a dialogue. But let's get through first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Fred Shank, Director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. We appreciate this opportunity to participate in today's hearing on the federal response to the potential human health threats posed by Pisteria um, piscicida. The committee asked for FDA's testimony on the potential human health threats that may be posed by Pisteria via human consumption of seafood. As you know, the initial event that identified Pisteria as a potential problem in Maryland was the kill, the fish kill in the Pocomoke River. Human health concerns were raised because of the environmental exposure to the organism. There have been no reported human illnesses confirmed or otherwise attributed to seafood exposure via Pisteria. Nonetheless, we cannot be and we have not been complacent about the possible food safety concerns posed by Pisteria. For the past six years, since Pisteria was first uh, described in North Carolina in 1991, the FDA seafood research scientists have been closely following developments related 
to Pisteria. Our scientists have made direct and ongoing dialogue with the researchers studying this organism. We would like to submit a summary of our efforts in this matter for the record. Early reports were that Pisteria is toxic to virtually all species of fin fish, as well as shellfish, such as scallops and clams. But toxic effects of fin fish, scallops, and clams do not necessarily mean that there are adverse human health effects from seafood consumption. Based on what we know so far, human illness from the consumption of fin fish seems improbable because fin fish are killed so rapidly that they're unlikely to accumulate the toxin, and because the affected fish are so unattractive due to bleeding sores that they are unlikely to be consumed. FDA remains vigilant, however. We have examined crabs taken from the Pocomoke River in which the fish kill occurred and found no evidence of toxicity in the crabs attributable to Pisteria. As part of our ongoing dialogue with Pisteria expert Dr. Joanne Burkholder of North Carolina State University, FDA learned that oysters survive in a laboratory in the presence of the Pisteria organism. At FDA's request, Dr. Burkholder provided us with oysters exposed to the cultured Pisteria, and our Washington Seafood Laboratory is testing these or oysters. Preliminary results, and I underscore the fact that they are preliminary, have not detected any toxicity associated with the oysters. Final testing results, however, will not be available for several more weeks. FDA will also test fin fish and crustaceans for their ability to accumulate Pisteria toxin. We will also be working in collaboration with other researchers in culturing Pisteria and characterizing the dinoflagellate source of the toxin and the toxins themselves. We are pleased to keep the subcommittee informed as information develops on the effects of Pisteria and seafood safety. In closing, let me reassure the committee that FDA remains vigilant for any possible health problems posed by Pisteria. However, to date, there is no evidence of any health problems posed by Pisteria through the food chain. Having said that, I think that the concerns now raised about Pisteria are an important reminder that seafood safety is dependent on a complex interplay of environmental, seafood har harvesting, and other production and human factors. Through our Office of Seafood Research Efforts and through our regulation of the seafood industry using the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points Program, we seek to make certain that the seafood industry provides the U.S. consumer with safe, wholesome fish. My colleagues and I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shank. Dr. Jackson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Jackson. I'm director of the National Center for Environmental Health at CDC in Atlanta. I'm accompanied by two of my colleagues who have been actively involved in the investigation, mm -hmm. Dr. Henry Falk and Dr. Carol Rubin. I will shorten my comments and ask that my full statement be entered into the record. CDC's relevance to this issue is, one, our longstanding record of working with states, two, our laboratory, particularly the toxicology laboratory, and three, our background in epidemic investigation. CDC does not go into investigations unless we are invited to the, with the states, and we always work very closely with again. the states. We usually wait for an inv request, an invitation from the state before we go in. If we've got a multi-state problem, we'll go in if we feel the state isn't really doing enough, but almost always the states invite us in to become involved in their investigations. So why, because they're doing their own investigation or because, um, I don't why would you have that? There are many, many investigations that state health departments do that they do not need help from CDC. Um, sometimes they do. I was a state health official in California for 15 years and I only invited CDC about once a year. If, if the state, if you wanted to come in and the state didn't want you, you still have the authority to come in, correct? We would want to... Uh, convince them first that it was in their best interest. Uh, ultimately, yes, we would go in. Yeah, but you have the authority. That's correct. Okay. Secondly, people think of CDC as an infectious disease investigation agency, and that laboratory is that. But in fact, our lab is the premier lab in the world for looking at toxics in human specimens, serum, blood, urine, and uh, can look at, for example, 200 different toxins and a little bit of fat in one test tube of blood. Um, and so looking at broad-scale 
prevalence of toxic substances in the population is something we're uh, quite skilled at. And then thirdly, we uh, are actively involved in epidemic investigations uh, throughout the nation and doing surveillance uh, for uh, illness problems. We first became involved with this issue when Senators Sarbanes and Mikulski and the Maryland Commissioner of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Marty Wasserman, requested that we assist the Maryland Department of Health in their Pocomoke River investigation. On August 12th, two senior epidemiologists went to Maryland to provide advice and assist in the investigation. And the following week, one of our physicians took part in the medical examinations conducted by the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins University. Thirteen people who reported symptoms and signs that might be related to environmental exposure to Fisteria were examined, and the preliminary results of the examinations were recently released and found that most of the patients reported dermatologic, neurocognitive, respiratory, gastrointestinal complaints. CDC's physician also found that based on the exposure information gathered in the interview, the complaints do not seem to be restricted solely to exposure to the river during times of fish kills. I, I don't know. I, translate that for me. What does that mean? Um, it means that we're seeing these symptoms uh, at times when the fish kills are not going on. We're not sure exactly what that means, whether but, uh, the symptoms are perduring from other exposures. Sorry. But people who are e uh, exposed to the water, not, in other words, you're seeing this in the general population, you're seeing it among people who are fishing and, we, and we near, the sound, near the water. Question. My understanding is the people who uh, came forward and reported these complaints were the ones who were examined, and the prevalence of claim complaints were seen, yes, during fish kills, but also not necessarily during the fish kill mm -hmm. times as well. And the information that was gathered used a short questionnaire and very few subjects. Much more data must be gathered and analyzed before we can draw any firm conclusions between fisteria exposure and human health effects. Following the completion of those examinations, we worked uh, with the state health officer in Delaware, uh, continued work there. The state of Cal uh, North Carolina was first to be affected with fisteria blooms and has the most experience in dealing with the organism. And since August, we've had numerous discussions and conference calls with the health department there. At the request of North Carolina on September 5th, one of our uh, physicians uh, went to North Carolina, reviewed, summarized, and analyzed the reports of exposure of health effects that the state had collected over the past few years. That analysis is not complete, but a preliminary report has uh, been f uh, forwarded to North Carolina from us. We, uh, the communication with the states is extremely important. We've been on virtual daily conference calls with the state health departments, um, uh, particularly since the request from the two senators. On September 10th, I conducted a conference call with the health officers and their staffs from all of the southeastern coastal states to discuss a public health response. On the basis of these discussions, we decided to sponsor and host a workshop on September 29th and 30th in Atlanta, next Monday and Tuesday. Um, to plan out a coordinated, comprehensive, multi-state public health program to provide scientifically valid information on public health effects of fisteria exposure. We have invited health department staff from each of the seven coastal states, as well as FDA, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, and other colleagues at NIH. It's important to note that fisteria is a multifaceted problem, and exposure is being, and the workshop is being convened to assess only the public health approach to human exposure. This will be a working meeting with uh, limited attendees. It has enthusiastic support from the state health departments, and we're looking to put forward a uniform but flexible case definition, because we're not really sure exactly what is the constellation of symptoms uh, that is associated with this exposure. Once you've got a good case definition, you can begin to determine how many people there are that are exposed, what's the prevalence geographically, what's the prevalence over time. Our environmental lab will assist in the, uh, following the lead of NIEHS in uh, identifying the toxin, uh, looking at uh, samples in the population and prevalence of the toxin in the population, if the, it can be nailed down further what it is. We've also been in constant contact with the other federal agencies over time. To summarize at this time, there are more questions than there are answers concerning Fisteria. The questions concern both the organism and its possible effects in human health. We believe that putting a comprehensive plan similar to what I described, we can work with the states and other federal agencies for valid data to 
may answer questions concerning human health consequences of exposure to posterior. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Uh, Mr. Whalen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my testimony uh, really describes, I think this is probably live. Let me ask you, is that, no, let me see if there's a switch on there and see if that switch. Thank you. Are we hearing you now? Uh, yes, I think that's yeah. live. Good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My testimony describes three broad categories of EPA responsibility and action with respect to hysteria. In the interest of time, I'm really going to concentrate my oral remarks on one of those. First of all, we're assisting states with their responses to the immediate outbreaks. And I believe earlier today, Governor Glenn Denning and other state witnesses have described EPA's support to them in those endeavors. Secondly, with other federal agencies in the academic community, we are a participant in supporting research to better understand uh, the effects uh, and causes of the hysteria outbreaks. Lastly, but very importantly, uh, EPA is responsible for and pursuing actions to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loadings to the nation's waters. Although conclusive evidence has not been found yet to link nitrogen and phosphorus with toxic outbreaks of hysteria, there is a very strong association based on the outbreaks to date. In addition, there's been an extensive research and strong evidence to suggest that nitrogen and phosphorus levels lead to other harmful algal blooms, some of which are toxic and harmful to human health, such as red and brown tides. Nutrient pollution also leads to low levels of oxygen and fish kills, something which I know you as a member, as the chair of the Long Island Sound Caucus, are very familiar with. We believe that further reducing the levels of nitrogen and phosphorus in our nation's waters is imperative in order to prevent the risks to human health as well as the associated environmental degradation and economic impacts caused by fisteria outbreaks and other harmful algal blooms. Therefore, we firmly believe that any public health policy on this issue needs to consider reduction of nutrient pollution in our waters. Specifically, EPA is planning to review and, where appropriate, strengthen existing programs in the following areas. Non-point sources. We need to increase the implementation of non-point source best management practices and work to approve and implement strengthened state non-point source programs. We need to work with the Department of Agriculture to assist farmers in using the appropriate levels of fertilizers to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus in agricultural non-point source runoff. We need to address other sources of nitrogen releases, including air deposition. We want to support and encourage voluntary efforts of state and local governments, watershed associations, and trade associations by supporting the development of low-cost co process changes for the control of nutrients at municipal wastewater treatment plants such as the biological nutrient removal, which is a key to our efforts in the Long Island Sound. We need to support the development and implementation of site-specific watershed management plans addressing excessive nutrient loadings, uh, as are a feature of many of the comprehensive conservation and management plans in the 28 national estuary programs, in the Chesapeake Bay program, and in our Gulf of Mexico hypoxia activities. We need to support habitat restoration and preservation of buffers to help reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loadings from non-point sources to susceptible waters, including through the use of the Clean Water Act's wetlands protection authorities. We want to support and are supporting agricultural and other industries' efforts to voluntarily implement best management practices for reducing non-point source runoff and air emissions of nitrogen and phosphorus. We do have regulatory authority for addressing discharges associated with confined animal feeding operations, and we have a strategy underway to strengthen implementation of those regulatory programs. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I think I'll suspend at, at this point. Uh, my prepared statement uh, provides glorious detail on each of these and other uh, EPA activities. It's been a long day. Well, it has been a longer day for you all than it should have been because you were all scheduled to be here at 1 o'clock, and you've just basically had to wait to figure out when you would be called. So. Uh, this is not our finest hour, and I'm sorry that you had to do that. Uh, I want to uh, just have you say, each of you, in a few sentences, what your role is in the hysteria. In other words, why are you here? Describe it, and I want to collect it. And I mean, you've, you've said in pretty big detail what you're doing, and focus, and some of you have been a little more precise, but I mean, for instance, uh, Department of Commerce is involved in the water and water-based wildlife. But I want you to just first tell me what you're involved in and then what your role is in this process. I want to just see if we have any, uh, from a federal standpoint, where we have the holes in the system, if uh, holes in the net, whatever, that or maybe we have the complete picture right here. And maybe you can tell me where the picture isn't complete. But Mr. Garcia? Uh, Noah. 
Department of Commerce have, um, uh, I guess, multiple roles that we're playing. Uh, as you noted, uh, we are a trustee for living marine resources. Uh, we're responsible for coastal, coastal and ocean resources. Uh, as such, we've been conducting long-term research on the general issue or the broad issue of harmful algal blooms now for a number of years. As I noted in my testimony, we've got a map up here which uh, plots out the incidence of uh, these blooms. Now, and uh, you, were, you were involved in putting the modeling together for the Long Island Sound study in, in terms we of... Are yeah. Correct. We're conducting research on red tides and brown tides. Right. Uh, and so NOAA's role in this particular issue is threefold. Okay. Uh, providing assistance to states in the short-term monitoring and assessment of the problem, uh, engaging in near- and long-term research on the problem again, uh, among other things, attempting to identify the toxin. I have with me today, and I should have mentioned this earlier, Drs. John, John Ramsdale and Don Scavia. Uh, Dr. Ramsdale has been working on identifying the toxin, uh, which will lead to uh, a test uh, for field testing uh, to determine the presence of the toxin, as well as aiding in the detection of contamination of food products. Uh, so one is assisting the states uh, in monitoring assessment. Two is near and long-term research. Three is a management responsibility, which we share with EPA uh, principally, and that is in identifying and controlling sources responsible for this bloom and other incidents in the coastal and marine environments. Okay. Dr. Olden, you started getting the, really the micro responsibilities and studies you were doing. Give me the more macro view yes. of... Um, <coughs> we are in the National Institutes of Health. I'm going to ask you to put the uh, mic in. We have both... Uh, uh, we're magnifying your voice, not that that needs it, but we also have the C-SPAN mic next to it. Uh, our role is fourfold. First is to purify and characterize the toxin, and we're well on our way to doing that. Uh, next is to examine the human health effects, and with Dr. Morris and others, we're well on our way to doing that. What we need is a larger cohort study. Uh, thirdly, uh, to determine the mechanism of action. In other words, if we do demonstrate that there is a human health effect or health effects, then we would like to know by what mechanism do these toxins uh, cause uh, neuro neurological problems and memory loss and uh, how do they cause uh, skin rash and sores. And finally, the fourth objective is to develop prevention intervention strategies. In other words, how can we prevent uh, these human health effects. Thank you. Um, you kind of get on more than one side of the picture then. I mean, you're, you're, you're getting into the health effects, but you're also getting into the, the <laughs> hysteria itself. Yes. Be before we can examine the health effects, we have to have the purified preparation of the toxins. Now, that will allow the other people at the table to do a lot of other things. For example, to develop a, a, uh, a test to identify hysteria, uh, and that's very important so that they, we will know. Uh, in other words, right now, the, w the way that we know that they're, they exist is we, we see them blooming. But obviously, they're there long before they increase in number so that there are blooms. So, uh, but we're involved in a number of stages, and I would say the most critical, I think, to this whole area and I think every speaker that's appeared here indicated that, and that is the isolation and characterization of the toxins and, uh, d and, and develop, create an enough of it in large quantities so that we can do the studies that are necessary. Mm -hmm. And presently, we cannot do that. Very interesting. Uh, FDA gets involved, the food. Uh, so you're concerned about the food. What else? Mr. Chairman, that's our primary concern, and that is the safety of the seafood for human consumption. Uh, if this toxin is a health concern to any segment of the, the population through food consumption, then we want to we want to prevent it. Um, to prevent it, we, uh, we 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 have to be able to test for it in foods. And as Dr. Olden says, we need to uh, look at those dinoflagellates when they're blooming and when they're toxic, in order to prevent it from coming in to begin with. Okay, thank you. Repeat the last line you said. My, I started to think something. So make the last point again. The, um, if, if we find out the toxin is a problem to humans, we want to prevent it. 
to do that, we need analytical methods to test for it in foods. Uh, and as Dr. Olden suggested, the second area is to identify those blooms or those dinoflagellates when they are toxic so that you shut off harvesting of the, the fish from those waters. Jared, we're hearing your voice. Jared, we need to get you off yet. Um, Ms. Dr. Jackson. The first day of uh, epidemiologic training for all new epidemiologists, they teach you how to investigate an outbreak. And step one is to confirm the diagnosis and have a case definition. Is, you know, you really need to know, is it everyone with a headache within five miles of a river, or is it only people that uh, put their head next to an aquarium that was loaded? And you've got to come up with a definition that is yeah. going to fit somewhere in between the two. The second step is to figure out how many people have this, how big is this, how broad, widespread, what are the symptoms that appear in these folks, and how long do they last? Thirdly, it's very important and useful to have a laboratory test that you can apply to populations. It's important to both have a new method that will detect something, but then you've got to decide, is this going to work in a thousand people and how well can you then look at large populations with a new laboratory test? This is also useful for looking at food and other specimens as well. And actually, the last step of epidemic investigation is to institute control measures. It's not good enough to go out and look at this you then have to make formal public health recommendations about what needs to be done to make sure this epidemic stops. Okay. And that's what we need to do here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whalen? I, I tried to uh, paint in fairly broad strokes at the you outset, did, Mr. You did, Chairman. but I'm going to have you just summarize again. Sure. Um, fundamentally, in fact, in much... In fact, you triggered the question. Okay. Much of our, much of our work is associated with uh, our responsibilities under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Uh, we have responsibility to characterize uh, the condition of the nation's aquatic resources uh, and, and air resources and to address sources of pollution to both of those. And air deposition, for example, is a significant cause of, nu of nutrient and nitrogen over enrichment to coastal waters and other, and other waters. So uh, pollution control, pollution characterization is a very important responsibility. Coupled with that, uh, we have uh, a strong network of partnerships with state government in the implementation of these responsibilities. Beyond the uh, traditional approach of uh, developing standards and having those standards implemented through control mechanisms by, uh, by and large by state agencies, we've been working to develop collaborative processes to try to come up with creative solutions to new and emerging problems. The Long Island Sound program as part of the National Estuary Program is one model for that. We're advancing that same kind of model through uh, watershed protection efforts uh, nationwide because we recognize that traditional regulatory approaches to pollution control may not give us the best mechanisms and tools with which to deal with problems like uh, uh, transfers between media, air to water, water to air, uh, and uh, discharges by numerous diffuse sources, uh, trying to deal with agricultural runoff represents a different challenge than dealing with direct discharges by large municipalities uh, or manufacturing entities. Um, so we see a, an evolution uh, in our approach from a, 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 an effective but limited pollution control from major facilities to uh, co more collaborative approaches to dealing with uh, non-point source pollution and other sources of, of diffuse insults to the environment. Yes. Dr. Olin, you want to just make a comment? Yes. In uh, and, and one sentence, our job is to provide quality science to policymakers like you so you can make the difficult policy decisions that you, you have to make. And this is uh, uh, one of the many issues, uh, uh, just an example of one. Okay. So our job is to provide the quality science that underscores and underpins the quality of your decisions. Right. Well, I'm going to have one of you take on the task of summarizing what's missing from this picture, if anything. And then I'm going to see if one of you could just go through the chain of events and tell me how some, in some cases, there's duplication, correct? I mean, there's overlap. Uh, I mean, you're all doing research. A good number of you are doing research. I, I think there is no unnecessary overlap. I, I think it's say, I, I didn't quite say, healthy. I didn't say... Un, right. No, I mean, what I want to... I mean, I may have said that later, but I didn't say yes, because I haven't come to a conclusion. Um, what I'd like is for one of you um, to just f go through the chain. I mean, uh, where, do we, where would we start? Would we start with the fact that we think a hysteria is caused by pollution? Do we accept that? And then who triggered in first and so on? I mean, uh, t 
tell me if this is a complete picture. I have five different federal agencies here, um, and and you are you all have incredible roles in a whole host of areas. But in this case, you have outlined a certain area of, of responsibility. Who would be the first person into this picture? You're all looking at me like it's a dumb question. Well, That's I think not obviously. The Either it has to be CDC because there would be a problem, but in this particular case, NIEHS was the first organization in the picture because yeah. we were approached by Dr. Burkhalder to help her with the problem that she had, and that was to isolate and purify the toxin. Uh, but, and that is the first thing that you need yeah. before you can do the toxicology. Yeah, but, but it's interesting, that the, the, in, and Dr. Jackson, you kind of triggered the question. Uh, because you're going to come at the invitation. And uh, it, I would have thought that CDC kind of would be the first in the picture. Actually, I would think a whole number of you would have kind of been there. I would have thought e EPA would have been there. I would, have, I would have thought that CDC would have been there. It would strike me that, y that the institutes wouldn't have gotten involved until there was a request for something from someone. There I'm more comfortable with why it would take a request. but. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think it's. No, a, yeah. I think you were right. It, it, it's a combination. Uh, all of the agencies at this table have uh, had some responsibility or responsibilities in connection with this particular organism, as well as the broader class of, of harmful algal blooms. Uh, I mean, CDC is brought in uh, at the request of a state. Uh, the research that has been conducted by EPA, by NOAA by the other agencies has been going on for a number of years through the Sea Grant program, uh, NOAA, and also through EPA grants. Federal funds were being made available to uh, researchers such as Dr. Burkholder uh, to identify this problem. A and uh, I just make one point on, on overlap as well. Um, th there's, I would suggest that the systems that we need are in place there may be a question. There yeah, may be a question. That, that was a notice. Okay. Yeah, we have time. We're going to spend 10 minutes and we're going to finish this issue and you're going to be able to go home. Yeah. Um, there may be a question as to whether or not we have all of the resources that we need to address the problem in each of the areas that I identified as NOAA's responsibility. Uh, but I, I think that we are working in each of those areas and have been uh, on this broader national issue. Uh, on no, the question I, of overlap, no, though, I don't, don't want to waste my time mm -hmm. here and, 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 and in terms of my interest right now. What I'm trying to get a handle on, what triggered what, when, and how well uh, coordinated are we to deal with this issue? And, and you know, uh, it would strike me that, that um, uh, I mean, for instance, F FDA is not going to get involved right away because uh, you got these, well, excuse me, that's not right. You've got these dead fish, so FDA might be called. You know, you got these dead fish. What's called? And you know, are we selling fish in this area? Is this a, is this a health concern? So I would see how you would have gotten triggered right away, but you wouldn't necessarily have gotten anybody else involved. You see what I'm trying to? We would go looking for. We would go looking for the the. As you know, the the. Uh, uh, I'm going to back up. I know how I'm going to ask the question. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, just to me, I. You, the first person into this picture w was was the Institutes, correct, of Health? They were the first, and that was the request. Just help me, you're smiling here. What, what well, sir, it of? was not a request. Uh, it was 1991, Dr. Burkhalder is a scientist in the same region of the country, matter of right. fact, just down the street from where we are. She knows that we are the premier toxicology research center in the world, so why not call us up and say that she had an interest in finding, and were we interested in investigating? And, and the answer was yes, and we got started. Okay, uh, but you know, it's that that leaves me kind of uncomfortable. You know, if she didn't live near where you were, you no, know, no, it w we would have been in any 50 states. If that had happened, there is a problem now yeah. of frogs having deformities in Minnesota, Wisconsin. We were called in again because we are the okay. premier toxicology research center. Dr. Shank, and I it could have yeah. happened in Hawaii, Alaska. Well, anything. Uh, I, I, I got some discomfort here. But you want I can make my point very briefly. Okay. I think um, anytime we see something that is that is tradition in the food supply, such as fish, and they start dying for whatever reason, we get concerned and we try to st we start sticking our nose into it. Uh, we would then look 
uh, try to, to follow the research and identify what was causing it. Um, we, don't, we don't become as heavily engaged until we have some reason to believe that, that the toxin may be going into to, to uh, have some reason to believe that the toxin is toxic to something other than the fish. No, I understand. I just, I'm just trying to see, it just seems, I mean, I, it would strike me that some, some event happens and one government agency gets involved and they contact other government agencies and there's this coordinated effort and it strikes me that there was kind of this, and, and I'm not placing blame and I may ha have it, the picture wrong, but it strikes me that it's, it, it, one agency gets involved, you do your thing, another agency gets involved somehow, you all didn't get involved at the same time. When it's, I'd well, like I, to know, it, now, this is one question. Uh, and and maybe you you know if you want to stay I'll come back. But when did each of you get involved? When did you get involved in this issue uh, r raised uh, in, by in 1991? When would you when would you we have been involved in the research effort since the late 80s? Okay, I don't I don't mean research in general about hysteria and no. toxins. I mean as it related to North Carolina. As it related to North Carolina, yeah. since the late 80s, we have been researching or assisting in the research of this organism. Okay. So basically, you were there from the beginning and had a close contact. Through various programs, such as Sea Grant, that we fund. So I, I would say that the researchers were there, and it was a multi-agency, multi-disciplinary So you knew about uh, Joan Burkholder right correct. away, and you know what she's doing, and you were in, right in there. Uh, the same with the institutes. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yes, I had uh, yes, the three pages that I missed would have laid out for you the, the coordination uh, okay. of, of bringing us all together. And I will submit that so you can well, see it. OK, well, that's a shame. That would probably been the part I'm you sorry. should have told me. Um, Dr. Shank? Yes, the document we submitted to the rec record states that our first involvement from a research perspective was 1991. Dr. Jackson? We had been in informal dialogue with Dr. Burkholder and invited her down to do a seminar uh, sometime uh, this past the invitation had gone out in the last few months before this occurred. We do not at CDC become involved in fish kills or aquatic problems. Uh, we do become involved when there are allegations and reports of illness. As soon as Marilyn called us and asked us to be involved, we were there within a few days. Um, Mr. Whalen? We designated Albemarle Pamlico Sounds as part of the National Estuary Program in 1989. The NEP provided grant support to Dr. Burkholder, I believe, in 1993 or 94. It's probably our first sort of direct financial involvement with the, the specific research associated with hysteria in North Carolina. Is, is which one of you takes the lead on this issue to coordinate the activities of the other, if any of you? Mr. Chairman, I was going to make yeah, that sure. point. The all of the agencies here have been involved in a very well coordinated uh, effort which the White House through the Council on Environmental Quality has been coordinating since the summer in dealing with this particular okay. problem in Maryland. Okay. And, and believe me, this is not a criticism, no, no, I, I just, but, but when you say the summer, I mean, and it's good, and, it's, and, it, and place the blame on me, I'm just getting involved right. now. So, I mean, I, I can't throw stones here. Uh, but, but if someone from the outside were looking in, should that have happened sooner? And if so, how would it have been triggered? How would the, the, the coordination have been triggered? Do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, it happened this summer. Is it the president that basically in the end does it? Well, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there was not a coordinated effort because, as I had said and as several others said, there was a coordinated research effort underway to identify and isolate the toxin uh, and to develop a program for dealing with the management of this and other marine biotoxins. Uh, this particular effort was prompted by uh, a request from the state of Maryland, which came in this summer, which EPA and NOAA responded through with uh, responded to with grants, which CDC and other agencies. But doesn't, doesn't it strike you that again that it's the state that kind of is triggering it? The primary responsibility I mean, in state through. waters, again, is, is the state. Yeah. We have been providing assistance and research to them so that they can manage the let problem. Me, let me tell you what I'd like to do. Um, uh, are there, I'd like to, to free all of you from having to come back. But if you have any assistants who want to pursue this a little bit more, um, I'm going to just come back and we're going to have an informal conversation because I want to get a, a better handle on it. So um, 
Uh, but I'm going to uh, just do one ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days and without objection so order. And also ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so order. Dr. Holden, if you want to just stay around and just talk informally about the coordination or, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's kind of a crazy way to do it. Um, uh, let me leave it this way. Let me have the staff uh, work with you all on this effort, and uh, maybe this will be the way we'll focus our next hearing. We'll have you come, not you, but some people from your agency come first, <laughs> so you don't have to wait this time, and uh, we'll just sort that out. But, you know, you've triggered a question. You get involved when the state, you, you made reference to the state. I do believe there's coordination, but I don't know what triggers it. Um, we have a few more minutes. I'll just let you, first off, is there anyone that accompanied you you just feel needs to make a comment? Uh, I mean, some of you have, are, are, is there any one person who wants to just step in here? Yeah, uh, you enable me to call that. I know you. Yeah. Is there, yes, sir, and just identify your name. Dr. Falk is the division chief where this yeah. activity occurs and at CDC. Could someone find out how much time I have before I can vote? Yes, sir. Right on, Identify your name again. My, my name is Henry Falk, and I'm with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, yes, Georgia. Sir. You know, I think there is, in a sense, a logical progression from the marine environment yeah. to uh, the development of the organism, effects on fish, effects right. um, on people, development of disease, and, and then what triggers a clinical picture. Yeah, I would love to, s you know, I wish we had and more time to go through right, that. Right, and, and I think what you're um, um, really looking for is which one of those things really triggers Yes. a broader response, because each of us is working on one of those pieces. And, and I think that that depends oftentimes on the particular situation. In this instance, where uh, human illness had not been you know, quite so prominently linked up in advance, I think the, the, um, sort of the, the, uh, the striking fish kill is what really uh, triggered a lot of um, the activity, and then the appearance of illness this summer really magnified the coordination. Okay, this, uh, thank you to, to your sensitivity to that question and your response. I have like four minutes. I've never missed a vote since I've been here in 10 years, so I'm almost tempted, but not quite. <laughs> um, this will uh, has set the stage. We will have another hearing, and uh, we'll, we'll sort this out. And, and I know there's a lot of great work on all your agencies, and I just need to understand it better, and we just need to see if there's some loose ends that we might make some suggestions in filling. So I will call this hearing to conclusion. Congress has already approved $7 million for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention.